School Board of the City of Virginia Beach, and I hereby call this meeting to order at 6.01 p.m. on this 23rd day of August 2022. As uh, public seating is, is available for all present, and as always, members of the public will be able to observe this meeting through live streaming on vbschools.com, broadcast on VBTV channel 47, and on Zoom. Madam Clerk, with that, would you please announce those school board members in attendance? Thank you, Chair Rye. Present in school board chambers are Chairwoman Rye, Vice Chair Melnick, Ms. Anderson, Ms. Felton, Ms. Holtz, Ms. Hughes, Ms. Manning, Ms. Owens, and Ms. Riggs. And presently attending via Zoom is Ms. Franklin and Ms. Weems. Thank you. Yes, and, and Ms. Uh, Franklin's in, in the building. Uh, Zooming in, and Mrs. Weems is away on personal travel. So I ask that you all please join me in a moment of silence. And please rise as you are able for the Pledge of Allegiance. All right, there are no recognitions this evening, so we'll, we, we will proceed to item eight, adoption of the agenda. Are there any modifications to the agenda? Mrs. Hughes. Yes, um, I have a proposed resolution that I would like to add to the information portion of the agenda, please. Is there a second? I don't hear a second um, for Mrs. Weems. Um, yes, Ms. Hughes, would you consider adding that for um, our next meeting since we didn't get a copy of it? Sure. Okay. Any other modifications to, to propose? All right, then a motion to approve. Mrs. Riggs, a second. Mrs. Anderson, all in favor, show a raised hand, please. Ms. Weems, how do you vote? Yes. Ms. Franklin, how do you vote? Yes. Thank you, Madam Chair. We have a unanimous vote. The motion did pass. Thank you. So that brings us, Dr. Spence, to your report. Yes, ma'am. Good evening, Madam Chairwoman and members of the board. So here are just a few items of interest for you and for our families to know. Uh, as we head up to the start of our school year. First, let's start with some great news. All of our 82 testing sites are projected to earn state accreditation again for 2022-23. The Virginia Department of Education, there we go. <clears throat> the Virginia Department of Education's preliminary data shows Virginia Beach City Public Schools outperformed all local school districts in reading, writing, math, and science. And as we noted in a recent uh, note to the board, we also outperformed seven other comparable divisions in reading and mathematics for the first time in recent history. And I say all that to say that I can't thank our teachers and staff enough for the outstanding work to build up each individual student. This preliminary data, of course, continues to be reviewed by staff and will be used to guide division and school level planning for the upcoming school year with an intense focus on improvement and continuing to meet the needs of all learners as we come out of the pandemic. We are embracing the challenges presented in this data, but also celebrating the incredible effort of our educators. And so if you have an opportunity to say thank you to our educators, we'd ask you to do so. We also note that the state um, has talked about taking a look here in the coming uh, weeks and months at the rules of accountability. We want to note that we will embrace that challenge as well. I believe and I know and I know that you all know that we have world class faculty, staff and students and that we provide a world-class education here in Virginia Beach, which this achievement clearly shows, and I could not be more proud. Second, the back-to-school care fair on August 13th was a huge success thanks to the student and adult volunteers who staffed the event 
and also to the 80 plus youth serving organizations, agency and school division departments who help families connect with valuable resources. Just a few highlights, about 3,000 people attended and 2,300 people were served lunch, which was provided by Papa John's, the Office of Food Services and the Virginia Beach Education Foundation. 1,300 backpacks were donated and distributed by our t the teams at Langley Federal Credit Union and Aetna Healthcare. Over 150 students received haircuts from Rudy and Kelly Academy and Legacy Barber Academy. 280 students received vision screenings. 2,300 bottles of water were donated and distributed by the NFL's National Flag Football <laughs> League. And about 100 children received health services, including vaccines and physicals, thanks in large part to the Virginia, Department, uh, Virginia Beach Department of Health. I want to give a special thanks to, the, to Principal Paula Johnson and the staff at Landstone High School for hosting the event, and also to the Department of Transportation for providing buses to make it easier for families to attend. I know I speak for the volunteers when I say that they appreciated seeing school board members and members of senior leadership come by to support and help out. And finally, thank you also to the Office of Family and Community Engagement Team and all of their dedicated volunteers for spending months organize, organizing this care fair. That is our second one, and that is a job well done. Mm -hmm. yep. <clears throat> also want to uh, tell you about work our district continues to do, making news as a leader in helping our students create a more sustainable future. The Green Schools National Network recently recognized the school division with several Green Print Trailblazers Awards. The nonprofit organization works with districts to shape healthy, equitable, and sustainable schools where children learn to steward the environments and communities they call home. The division received the Green Print Trailblazer Leadership Award for initiating a summit with Harvard University and Auburn University several years ago, and we were recognized for reaching green goals and blazing trails for other districts across the country. Our sustainability officer, Tim Cole, also received a Trailblazer Award for being instrumental in the promotion and development of LEED certified buildings, including the first LEED certified elementary school in Virginia, Hermitage Elementary School, and the first K-12 LEED Platinum Transportation and Maintenance Facility in the country. Old Donation School also received a Trailblazer Award for advocating for integrated instruction and project-based learning for all focused on sustainable issues. As we work to continue uh, uh, more on sustainability issues, I expect we'll continue to be recognized as trailblazers in this area. I'm also excited to report several of our staff members will be collaborating with educators across the state as a part of the Virginia Leads Innovation Network 4.0. This network's for educational leaders who recognize the need to continually develop their expertise and skills within a cohort of committed professionals. And the partnerships members combine focus areas and expertise to provide new integrated resources, trainings, and support for Virginia's education workforce. Next month, our participants will be meeting with over 180 educators from 32 school districts across Virginia to unpa unpack and apply specific professional standards for education leaders, which will help solve local problems of practice by identifying innovations that amplify organizational strengths and diminish achievement barriers. Our district's applicants were selected specifically for their outstanding commitment to leading innovation and learning, and I look forward to the impact they'll have across the state. And finally, <clears throat> just to let you know about some of the exciting things we're working on to welcome students and prepare staff for the upcoming school year. We have a packed schedule in the weeks ahead, as you know, aimed at making sure our teachers, administrators, and staff have what they need to help students succeed. New instructional staff are in the middle of several days of training. There's also training for fall growth assessments, special education administrators, literacy leaders, elementary math specialists, security assistants, and many, many more. In addition, the Department of Teaching and Learning sponsored five professional development conferences for teachers, specialists, and administrators this summer. Three virtual opportunities were offered, including a pre-K conference, a Title I conference, and a gifted symposium for staff and parents. Two face-to-face -face conferences were also offered, the Innovative Learning Summer Summit and Camp Canvas. Undergirding all of our preparations for this new school year is a message of hope which I've spoken with uh, about with our new teachers and also at our leadership conference. And we really want our staff, our students, and our community to know that hope isn't just a nice idea. It's actually one of the most powerful predictors of well-being and success in a well-studied uh, part of science. Our message to our students and staff, there is a better future, and you can influence that by having clear goals and identifying pathways to reach those goals. And we're here to help. And it's with that message that I look forward 
to our first day of school on September 6th and the bright year that lies ahead. That's it, Madam Chair. Thank you, Dr. Spence, and we all do look forward to that first day of school. <laughs> okay, approval of the meeting minutes, the August 9th, 2022 regular school board meeting. Are there any modifications to these minutes, colleagues? Okay, hearing none, motion to approve. Mrs. Riggs and a second, Mrs. Holtz. All in favor, show a raised hand. Ms. Weems, how do you vote? Yes. Yeah. Ms. Franklin, how do you vote? Yes. Thank and you, Madam up Chair. Step ex ex extensions. Oh. And we have one extension. Exempt extension <laughs> in uh, Chair Rye. So the motion to pass with 10 ayes and one abstention. Due to uh, missing uh, a good part of that meeting due to delayed travel. Okay. Okay, we now arrive at the public comment portion of the meeting. We will now, the school board will now hear public comments relevant to pre-K to 12 public education and the business of the school board and school division from citizens and delegations who signed up with the clerk prior to noon today. Uh, this, for speaker, uh, in-person student speakers will be called first, followed by student part speakers participating through Zoom. As, as usual, each speaker has three minutes to present and will be provided a 30-minute warning. Uh, once time has expired, we ask that you 30-second warnings. What did I say? <laughs> uh, if a speaker is not present when called to speak or not online or unable to unmute when called to speak, uh, the board at its sole discretion may allow the speaker to speak at the end of the public comment session. Uh, and members of the audience will not be recognized to assist an online speaker. Uh, as always, this, this board invites the public to submit comments through our group email account, which can be found on our website. And with that, Madam Clerk, would you please introduce the first speaker of the evening? Thank you, Madam Chair. Our first student speaker will be Joanna Watson and then Jalen Watson. Okay. Good evening. Good evening. My name is Joanna Watson. And okay, we'll have to ask you to speak up just a little bit more, okay, into the mic. All right. Good evening. My name is Joanna Watson. I've come here to ask to be able to stay in Virginia Beach Public Schools since I have been participating in this school system since about sixth grade. And um, it would just be easier for me as an upcoming senior to continue with this uh, learning program so that I may make it easier for myself to apply for scholarships and figure out what I want to do for the future. I am um, enrolled or was enrolled and hope to continue to be enrolled in the Salem Academy for Visual Arts and I have worked a, um, a lot to stay in this program and it would um, make me very happy to be able to stay for my last year so that I may graduate with my um, Academy um, uh, awards and stuff. Um, that would be all. Thank you for your time. Okay, thank you. Our next student speaker is Jalen Watson. And welcome to you. Um, hello, my name is Jalen Watson, and um, I would also like to stay in Virginia Beach schools. Um, I am applying for Tollwood because I like uh, studying world languages and Chesapeake schools don't have Japanese. Uh, I have already studied and have um, one year of Japanese already and I want to continue studying Japanese because I have interest in being a linguist. So um, I would hope to continue my studies. That will be all. Thank you for your time. Our next in-person speaker will be Heather Comer, then Jennifer Clements, then Jessica Miley. Good evening to you. Hey, good evening, uh, Chair Ms. Rye, Vice Chair uh, Ms. Melnick, school board members, and Superintendent Dr. Spence. My name is Heather Comer. I've been teaching in Virginia Beach for 27 years. Oh, that last two weeks ago. 
I attended Fort Virginia Beach schools from elementary to high school, went to college, came back to teach at the beach. When I started, there was a hiring freeze and there were thousands of applicants. Now we can't afford to lose teachers. Teacher retention is a hot topic. I was here at the last school board meeting because I'm passionately committed to Virginia Beach City Public Schools and I believe that you care about the retention of seasoned teachers. I'm here to talk about the fact that I love teaching in Virginia Beach. I want to stay in Virginia Beach. I could never have predicted my friends and colleagues leaving Virginia Beach schools after 30 years of teaching and going to other districts to teach. The craziest part is that I have multiple colleagues and friends who've left a 30 plus year career in Virginia Beach. They wanted to stay, but they have 10 plus years left in their careers. They couldn't afford to stay. If my friends and colleagues stay in teaching until age 65, like me, which for some of them will be 40 plus years of teaching because they started at 22, 23, 24 years old, they will make approximately $17,000 more than me at 40 years. Their salary goes up each year, and yet mine will remain stagnant. In my career, I benefited from thousands of dollars worth of VBCPS sponsored professional development. VBCPS paid for ODU classes, UVA classes, AP training from William Mary, NIMSI training, AVID training in Wicker Strand, and so much more. I've learned a lot and students benefited from the professional development. My friends and colleagues also benefited, but they took their VBCPS training and expertise and left to teach in other districts. All of them went to districts with salary increases each year after year 30. We have lot, lost a lot of great expertise to districts like Chesapeake. Their pay scale goes beyond 30 years. What message is VBCPS sending about the value of seasoned teachers? What message is VBCPS sending to teachers who, like me, start in their early 20s? I'm asking the board and Dr. Spence to revisit 30 plus scale and add years for all the teachers who started teaching in their 20s and made Virginia Beach City Public Schools a career and want to stay in Virginia Beach. Thank you. Our next speaker is Jennifer Clements, then Jessica Miley, and then Wendy Nelson. So welcome. Good evening. I'm here tonight to discuss a topic that should be of great significance to us all, the core values of our school system. For the past 19 years, I have served as a library media specialist at First Colonial High School. During that time, one of my many responsibilities was to build and maintain a book collection that represents multiple perspectives to engage a diverse population of teenagers. Two months ago, I started a new position with VBCPS as an instructional technology coordinator. Part of my work this summer has been to assist with formalizing clear and transparent procedures for parent library media specialist partnerships. And perhaps my most important role is that I'm the parent of four teenagers, three of whom are currently enrolled in Virginia Beach High Schools. I've always been proud to enroll my children in and work for a school division that prioritizes putting students first, seeking growth, and being open to change, which are three of the division's five core values. But they're two of the division's core values that I believe have been in jeopardy lately, valuing differences and doing great work together. VBCPS has made a commitment to valuing differences, which is defined on the VB School's website as demonstrating respect and by fostering a trusting, open, ethical, honest, and inclusive environment where diversity of thought is prized. However, there are members of this school community who have openly stated that the terms diversity and inclusion should be considered red flags. These same people are trying to limit student access to materials that represent perspectives and lifestyles that are different from their own. And they are condemning library media specialists who are attempting to value differences um, by disrespecting them publicly and hurling insults at them. At a time when staff retention is a major issue, this demoralizing behavior must not be accepted, lest we run the risk of losing more experienced educators who have dedicated their entire professional lives to the development of this community's youth. Another core value that the school division has adopted is, we do great work together. According to the VB Schools website, this means collaborating to build partnerships to benefit our students, division, and community. As a parent, I take many opportunities to support the education of my own children by respectfully communicating with people in their schools. And as a library media specialist, I always encourage partnerships with my school's parents. 
So I absolutely believe in the rights of parents and guardians to have input into the school seconds. library materials that their children check out. But by the same token, I believe that no one community member or small group should be able to infringe on the rights of other families by dictating what their children can read. If we want to do great work together, we must provide parents with avenues to make educational decisions for their own children while protecting the rights of other families to make similar decisions. As we enter into the new school year, I'd like to remind us all to uphold the core values so we can support all students. Thank you. And that is time. Our next speaker is Jessica Miley, then Wendy Nelson. Speaker five had to cancel, and then we'll move on to Meryl Rutledge. Good evening, and thank you for having me. I'm Jessica Miley. I'm the proud mother of two students at Old Donation School. And I want to thank you for this opportunity and also congratulate you on uh, your recent achievements of providing a world-class education. I'm here to talk about policy 712 around challenging controversial curricular materials and complaints from citizens. Uh, I'm also here to provide statistics and facts, and I will be citing my resources, um, not simply uh, spewing some hateful rhetoric as I've seen in previous board meetings. Um, the American Academy of Library Association Office for Intellectual Freedom points out that the top 10 books being challenged often deal with race, racism, or simply having a character who identifies as LGBTQ. In 2020, six out of 10 of the most challenged books were about race and racism and by authors of color, most of whom who were black. The ADL points to that books should serve as both mirrors and windows to reflect and represent our society. It helps young people see themselves and feel valued, the mirror. And separately, it provides children to learn about experiences of people who are different from them, the window. A 2015 article in Reading is Fundamental titled Mirrors, Windows, and Sliding Glass Doors illustrates how literature transforms human experience and becomes a means of self-affirmation. And I quote, when children cannot find themselves reflected in the books they read or when the images they see are distorted, negative, or laughable, they learn a powerful lesson about how they are devalued in the society of which they are a part. Our classrooms need to be a place where all children from all cultures that make up the salad bowl of America's society can find their mirrors, end quote. By narrowing our curriculum, it's impacting how young people not only see themselves, but it's impacting how they have empathy towards others who don't look like them, act like them, or perhaps have feelings for someone like them. It's hindering free speech, access to information, and altering their mindsets. Withholding this information is critical to developing a, a well-rounded worldview. I couldn't also help but notice that on the agenda, agenda is Suicide Prevention Week and National Hispanic Heritage Month. And if we continue to listen to community members without students in our school who have an interest in condemning our LGBTQ community or our black, 30 and, brown, seconds. Thank you, our black and brown families in our community, we are directly impacting these two topics in a major way. Suicide is the second leading cause of death among young people ages 10 to 24. So if we truly want to help our kids, let's help them see themselves in the books, the mirror, and learn about others who are different than them, the windows. And let's focus on allowing librarians to do their jobs and not spending their day needing to email parents whenever a child checks out a book. Thank you very much for having me. Our next speaker is Wendy Nelson, then Meryl Rutledge, then Sarah Gerloff. Good evening, Ms. Nelson. Hi. Hello, my name is Wendy Nelson. I am a high school library media specialist in VBCPS, as well as a parent of two recent graduates. Many of my amazing colleagues have stood before you tonight and in previous weeks and explained how passionate we all are about our work. Make no mistake, I love my job and I could talk about it all day. But I actually want to tell you a personal story, one I have never told anyone before. Upon the recent death of Olivia Newton-John, yeah, I recalled that when I was five years old, I was obsessed with the movie Grease, which had just come out. I was a precocious reader, and from some relative or other, that on Christmas that year, I got a photo novel of the movie. And for those who grew up after the invention of the VCR, a photo novel was sort of a comic book, except the illustrations were photos from the movie, and the dialogue from the movie was in speech balloons. Anyone who has seen Grease knows that that dialogue is suggestive, to say the least. On Christmas Day, my mom pulled that book right out of my hands and started flipping through it. 
She let me have it back, but first she took a big black Sharpie and crossed out all the dialogue she didn't want me to read. She thought she had solved the problem, but this just deepened my curiosity about what was behind those angry black slashes. How could I read it? I was five, but not dumb, and I quickly re realized I could secretly hold the book up to the light and read every word. <laughs> Did I understand any of it? Not at all. But my curiosity was satisfied. Was I scarred for life? Also, no. Nor was I scarred for life when I read Are You There, God? It's Me, Margaret, at age seven, and immediately took it to my best friend Tracy's house so we could try to figure out what it was talking about or Forever, or Flowers in the Attic, or Clan of the Cave Bear, or Stephen King books, which were and are scary as heck, or any other book, all of which, by the way, I got from my school library. I bet everyone has already spotted the allegory in this story. A society can censor books like my mom and her Sharpie, ban books in accordance with the current political playbook. You can even arrest librarians, call us disgusting names and burn down our libraries, but you cannot put out the fire that children have to learn about themselves and their place in the world they live in. Not the world of the past. Some people imagine they can resurrect, though truthfully, the idealization of the past is pure fantasy. But the real one, the troubled but beautifully diverse world our kids are growing up in now. Our students will hold us up to the light and they will not accept what they see. They question everything, even things we thought they would never question. 30 seconds. Put down your Sharpie and get to know all of our kids. These kids are amazing and curious and so accepting of each other. And they are also flawed and human, sometimes with problems most of us can only imagine. Each and every one deserves to see themselves in books as they really are. Let them read. Our next speaker is Meryl Rutledge, Sarah Gerloff, and then Joe, Fra Joe Fitzgerald. Good evening. Wait, did, Madam Clerk, did we skip one? Uh, Miss Bohan had to cancel. Okay. Excuse the interruption. Okay, go ahead, sir. Yeah. It's a sad reality. While well, looking in the room where parents should be all over this place and participating, and it seems like less and less parents are here when it's matters that are so important. We don't have our kids going to a adult bookstore or video store because they are not ready to handle what they see when they go through those doors. Many of them are not even ready to handle what happens to them as a kid. I spent the last couple of days talking to a family where their daughter goes to Virginia Beach Public Schools and she committed or tried to commit suicide. She was molested by a family member is working its way through the system. Just because you think one kid may handle things one way, doesn't mean other kids handle things the same exact way. Some kids are strong enough, and I tell them, even as much as you feel that you are a victim, continue to fight. Because we raise fighters, not victims. But still, it doesn't change the fact of what happened to these kids. When you put these type of books into our school, have you said to yourself, have this made our schools for the better or for the worse? Teachers are leaving at record numbers. We have social justice issues inside our books that has caused more division than bring people together. And we have a lack, a lack of empathy for those parents who have to work two or three jobs and then find out once their kids get home they are reading books far past their age, far past what our parents should teach them, not the schools. When we lost our focus on education, we have centuries of raising leaders, not centuries of dumbing down our kids and making them feel like they are below average because every kid has shown that they can be exceptional no matter where they come from. We cannot continue to devalue our kids and feel any less of them because we feel that they should be able to handle what we sometimes should not even promote. What we are reading in those books is not about people talking about love. We are reading about people talking 30 about seconds. Rape. We're talking about people talking about drugs, suicide, 
trying to find their sexuality. Things that are private. We do have that right of privacy, don't we? We shouldn't have to say who we are or what we are, but we surely should not make our schools a place where it's no longer about education and focusing on real leadership skills instead of furthering our schools for pedophiles and, that and is time. Thank you. Our next speaker is Sarah Gerloff, Joe Fitzgerald, and then Keely Arnold. Welcome, Ms. Gerloff. Thank you. Let's remember that it is a federal crime to transfer, distribute, sell, and receive obscene material, and that our Constitution, along with federal laws that support it, are still the supreme laws. Under Superintendent Spence, using the authority relinquished to him by the school board, pornographic material has been distributed in our schools. Parents and citizens challenged many books, and the response of Spence was to keep these obscene books in our schools for children to read. I will read some passages so that those listening can get an idea of the nature of these vulgar books. As many of these readings are so inappropriate for public broadcast to adults that they violate FCC regulations, I will be replacing inappropriate words with the word spence to help sanitize the filth. I will be reading from the book Tilt, which is about high school students. Page 19, a young student references his self-pleasure. Quote, I finish off a fat blunt and I am almost ready to finish myself off. Page 401, he tastes of weed and alcohol, but I don't care, and I give him as good as he gives me. He pulls me onto his lap, licks down my neck to the curve of my shirt. Take it off, he says, and as if he, as if he has hypnotized me, I do exactly as I'm told. Quickly, his hands unhook my bra, and before I can even think to say no, my entire body is bared. That's it, my pretty little girl. He moves to kiss my spence. And though I want to say no, I can't. It feels good, great, amazing. Beneath my skirt, I feel him grow hard against my thin barrier of my panties. He lifts me up, undoes my, his zipper, and it, this is no movie zipper, and this is no movie, when he freezes Spence and shows me exactly how to use my mouth to Spence. Page 43. 431, the kissing and licking and touching and rubbing, I do like it. It feels good. I totally get the lust part. If ever there was an Eve, this must be how she felt right after she first figured out what orgasm meant. Excited to try it, I will, but not now. Why don't they teach you this in school? That you, that you really don't need someone to make you feel this good. Ask me, self-pleasure could be the key to abstinence. So... As we now know, these obscene books that have been discovered in our schools, this is actually being taught in school, and it is sanctioned by porn peddlers. I recently completed a month-long training class seconds. on sex trafficking. Sex traffickers look for individuals with vulnerabilities. They groom their vulnerable victims by gaining their trust and by desensitizing them to sexual use and abuse with exposure to pornography. Groomers know that children's minds are vulnerable and malleable, so if they train children, children will believe that sexual abuse is normal. Sex trafficking is abuse and will never be normal. Spence has already committed the crimes and has harmed many innocent and children. And time. Lock him up and Our throw next away the key. speaker is Joe Fitzgerald, then Keely Arnold, then Jessica Kaysen Hawkins. Good evening. Good evening. Hello, thank you for having me. Uh, kind of crazy that we are even in these situations talking about this kind of stuff. Just like Lady just spoke about Greece. Um, I kind of remember the same thing when I was younger. And, uh, you know, it's called desensitization, uh, how far we've come and where we are now. It's, it's actually kind of shocking. Under superintendent's vents, under the authority of the school board, pornographic material is allowed in our schools. Many, many books have been challenged, and the response of the superintendent was to keep most of these pornographic books in the system, available to our students. He and the board then limited the ability of parents and citizens to challenge the presence of these books in our schools. Since the superintendent and the majority of the board appear comfortable with these books, I'll read you some of the passages from them, but we'll re replace any inappropriate words with a safe word. To honor those who work so hard to keep these books in our schools, my safe word, uh, again, will be Spence. The book I'm reading from is Tilt, which is challenged yet allowed to stay in the system by Dr. Spence using the authority of the school board, led by Chairman Rye and Vice Chairman Melnick. 
in tilt, a young gay high school student watches porn at home stating, you can get anything you want online. It's crazy, really. All you have to do is lie and say you're 18. Another part of that desensitization, lying's okay thing, you know. For now, I'll distract myself with some fine medicinal green and a little porn on the guy I, guy on guy variety. Mom, I'm smoking weed and checking out this little guy on guy action. Her eyes go wide at Mr. Top Spencing, Mr. Bottom. God, Jane. She clicks the mouse and the screensaver pops up as she launches a rant about how I'm paying for porn and pot. Other than that, mom doesn't do anything and doesn't stop him from watching the porn. On page 129, I hope some con with a giant Spence makes him his little b Spence. In tilt, a young student is taught to sext by her boyfriend who later rapes her. You can imagine as the father of daughters how evil I know this is. Lucas texts instructions, get naked and lie down on your bed. He gives me time to comply and I have to admit, I get a little thrill. Play with your Spence. Get it hard. I don't even know if I can say it. Get it hard. I want to pick. Beautiful. This is awesome. And I know I want another one. Touch 30 yourself. seconds. You know where. Let me see. He called me beautiful. That's a first. Am I beautiful? I look at the photo I sent him. While I wait for his response, I leave my hand where it is, just above a soft spencing between my legs and i have never touched myself there before not the way he wants me to but now i do later this girl is raped by the boyfriend you could lucas yet lucas yet she receives no help the rape is not reported and the girl gets and that is time treatment. thank you our next speaker is keely arnold jessica case and hawkins and then chris hawkins hello welcome I've been watching um, from home these school board meetings for a couple years, and I'm finally here to speak, and I'm not too happy with what's been going on. Um, I don't care how many librarians you have come up here to tell you how great these books are. I've seen these books with my own eyes, and they're not so great. They're, they have pornographic materials in them. Now, that's a fact. Under Superintendent Spence, using school board authority handed to him by the school board, pornographic material is allowed in our schools. This is grooming, okay? And the majority school board allows this to happen, protecting themselves by handing over decision-making power to Spence concerning these pornographic books. So when election time rolls around, they can just claim falsely that their hands are clean, okay? I don't, I don't like that too much. No, this is peddling porn. This is what this is, okay? Parents and citizens, challenge these books, but the majority of the school board and the superintendent Spence intentionally keep this porn in the schools. This is how we parents feel about this. This is pretty serious, okay? They're restricting parental rights to protect our children, uh, um, uh, rights to protect our children by limiting the ability to challenge the presence of porn in our schools. I will read some of the majority of what the school board and Spence used to groom and harm the minds of our children. And this is the light stuff. I'm not even getting into the really bad stuff, okay? And I will use a word just to cover some of the things I don't want to say, okay? From the book Tricks by Ellen Hopkins, appropriately named due to the sex and child prostitution content, our children read on page 63, all thereafter is free booze and an easy melnick. There we go. On page 59, too much booze, too many smokes, way too many pills, speed, downers, everything in between. On page 139, your children also get to read, wonder how hot his Melnick is. Um, I suspected Alyssa is not very happy about Ronnie um, jumping my bones. On page 237, we see examples of physical abuse and later in the book is a remembrance of the one of the many childhood rapes detailed of the books in the book tricks. There are so many laughable excuses provided by this administration, such as these books are easy for struggling readers or written in a style of a poetic verse. Really? 30 seconds. Superintendent Spence is supporting these books that the parents are publicly challenging to get out of the schools and the majority of the school board have been complicit. The school board denies responsibility directing decisions to the superintendent. No, you, our school board, are responsible for these books. Take your responsibility back and support the parents and remove Spence and stop peddling this porn. 
I'm serious. Our next speaker is Jessica Kaysen Hawkins and then Chris Hawkins. Good evening. Good evening. Hello. Um, I'm here today to talk about a situation with our family. Y'all did hear from my daughters earlier, um, and I appreciate that. We had an interesting situation, and this is just to give you the backstory. Um, we moved out of our house in the rise of COVID when everybody was sewing. And um, luckily we found something, but it ended up being on the border of Chesapeake and Virginia Beach. We have Virginia Beach utilities, but we're told that we had to take them out of Virginia Beach schools. And that was devastating for them as, as students who went through schooling at home. My youngest had some issues with um, certain things that I guess I'm not going to elaborate on, but both of them ended up in therapies. And I just want to thank you for having the consideration of keeping them in Virginia Beach Public Schools um, because this was a total surprise to us. We do have a Virginia Beach address. Again, we do have Virginia Beach utilities, but we are hopefully on track. I had to do everything I could as their parent to keep them in Virginia Beach Public Schools because this is giving them my oldest one last year in school is in the Art Academy. She's been doing very well now, now that they're back in the schools, which I, I'm, I'm a nurse, I totally appreciate that they had to be out of schools in the beginning. Um, but it was surprising, well, maybe not surprisingly, but it was so very detrimental to their mental health. And then to find out that now um, a hidden issue arose and they were going to be kicked out. <laughs> So I appreciate that I've, I've been, <laughs> it took a while to get to this point. We went in circles. We talked to the schools personally. We talked to um, different outlets. I even offered to become a substitute, uh, substitute nurse to maybe you know, find a way to make this work because as a parent, you try everything you can to get them on the track that they need to be to successfully um, shine. <laughs> and um, I hope that that's where we end up going. And I know and hope that they have given you seconds. a bit of their side of the story. And um, I think we are on track, and I do appreciate that. And it's just blown my mind. And, and I just need them to be happy and healthy. And <laughs> I hope this helps in making the decision to move forward and let them stay in the schools. Thank you. And that is time. Our next speaker is Chris Hawkins. Good evening. Hi, good evening. Um, thank you, members of the school board. Thank you, Dr. Spence, for listening to my, my family, my, my children, uh, my wife. And um, I've never seen a mother do so much to uh, advocate for uh, her children. and. I, I really appreciate you uh, hearing us out, and we're trying to do everything we can to have our kids uh, continue to, to go to the excellent Virginia Beach uh, school school system. And I just wanted to, I don't, there's everything, pretty much most everything they've already touched on, but I just wanted to, to cite a uh, Virginia uh, code, and this is uh, Title 22.1 of the Virginia Code of Education. And um, it says, the following persons may in the discretion of the school board of a school division and pursuant to regulations adopted by the school board be admitted into the public schools of the division <coughs> excuse me um, and then says persons of school age who are residents of the commonwealth but do not reside within the school division um, and so i'm hoping that our children can continue to re remain in virginia beach schools we we're not even sure what uh, city we live in that's not a matter for you guys to decide but we live right on the border virginia beach has a peak have a virginia beach a mailing address, and we're hoping to continue to have our kids go to Virginia Beach schools where they've been going since uh, 2016. And I thank you so much. Oh, I do have, uh, we did print out letters for uh, each and every one of you, if I can hand it to, to you. I, I really appreciate your time and consideration, and thank you so much, and I yield my time. Thank you. 
Madam Chair, that was our last in-person speaker. We'll move on to our online speakers. Stacy Martin, please unmute. Good evening, Ms. Martin. Good evening, Chairwoman Rice, school board members, and Dr. Spence. I'd like to share my thoughts today on a very specific aspect of the cell phone policy and about the policy in general. The way the policy is written is quite vague. It prohibits the use of cell phones in wearable tech or communication activities. However, I'm concerned that students who use wearable tech and cell phones for quality of life and medical issues, sometimes covered by IEPs and 504s, will be singled out for disciplinary action. Cell phones and wearable technology as it relates to specific medical conditions, such as diabetes management, weight management, ADD management, and asthma man management are covered by the ADA. I urge you to transmit downstream in writing to schools and teachers that students who use wearable tech and cell phones may do so if it relates to a medical condition that is documented in their 504. And switching gears, I wanna talk about our responsibility as educators when it comes to technology. We're often stuck between content and compliance. Do we take the time to get students into compliance and disrupt our dis delivery of content? I'm concerned about constant discipline, distracting from content delivery, penalizing students who are engaged, whether or not they have cell phones. As educators, it is part of our job to educate our students on appropriate use of technology in formal settings. When I go into the boardroom at my full-time job, both of my phones are with me, face down, on the conference table, on silent. There's tools that stand ready should I be asked a question, get a break to answer a client inquiry, or to look up data. I know intuitively not to pick up my phone and start scrolling if the governor or secretary of commerce is speaking. I know not to pick up my phone when our CEO is presenting, but I also know that I can pick up my phone and look up tourism expenditures or room night projections during a lull in the conversation. I know I can discreetly answer a client email during a short break during an hours long strategy session. Our students need to learn that protocol outright banning phones in the classroom does not teach them how to manage their technology as tools. Outright banning phones does not teach them how to manage their use of technology in formal settings. It's our job as educators to curate our students into adult settings. I would urge you to implement a program that teaches students on how to manage their technology appropriately in a variety of settings. Just like we code switch with language, our students need to learn how to code switch with technology. Thank you. Our next speaker is Tracy Murray. Please unmute. Welcome, Ms. Murray. Ms. Murray, please unmute. Can you hear me now? Yes, welcome, Ms. Murray. Thank you. The answer is what the answer to whether or not cell phones should be allowed in the classroom seems like a common sense answer. It should not. There are several reasons for the answer. However, the one that stands out the most is the same reason for not driving while on a cell phone. Focus. Anything that divides a student's focus shouldn't be allowed in the classroom. A teacher should not need to compete for a student's attention. This dilutes the educational process. It not only affects the student who has the cell phone, but also the student who does not. Distraction is the enemy of education. How many times have you talked to your child and had to say, pay attention? Unfortunately, banning cell phones is not easy and actually may not even be possible because cell phones are no longer just phones. If a student has a smartwatch, he or she in reality has a cell phone. It is hard enough to check for cell phones. It becomes impractical and unrealistic to expect educators to check daily for watches. Thus, the solution lies in not banning phones, but rather in developing policies on the use of phones. Some suggestions are requiring cell phones to be put in the student's locker when he or she enters the building 
nice idea, but are educators going to require watches to also be put in lockers at the beginning of the day? Thank you. Our next speaker is Daphne Stagg. Please unmute. Good evening, Ms. Stagg. Ms. Stagg, we unmute. Let's proceed. We'll check it up at the end if okay. we need to. Our next speaker will be Paula Chang. Please unmute. Good evening, Ms. Chang. Good evening, Mrs. Can you all hear me? Because we have had a very difficult time with technology here tonight. And um, you may have I'm to come clear. back. Can you, can you hold off for a second before the countdown and come back? Because my husband's having a hard time getting on. Thank you for restarting the clock. OK, I'm ready. Um, the I'm presence here. Can you hear me? Loud and clear. OK, OK, thank you. The presence of pornographic and grooming material and practices in our school, and they do exist, reflect directly on the individual who make the decisions to allow this. The idea that parents must stand, fight, and be shut down in their efforts to remove pornography by the board we elected says all we need to know. We know the board chose Superintendent Spence, and we know they, we chose him again, even though he allows this in the schools because they just renewed his contract. And this is a disservice to our students and a clear reason we need to elect a new board, one which protects our children. Case in point, I challenged the book Ellen Hopkins, a book full of sex with minors, pornography, pressuring a pregnant teen into abortion, sex between an HIV positive individual and his minor aged boyfriend, sexting, rape, drugs, the dark web, you name it, it was there. Some of the deep intellectual prose included such things as quote unquote, you can hear the canned moans that can only mean they're watching cable porn and, quote, make yourselves at home, he says, patting the sofa beside him. Orgy? And I'm telling you that this is the clean stuff. It is disgusting what's in this book. So I read the book and I challenged it in May of this year due to my concerns regarding the content as inappropriate. The denial of my challenge arrived back in July and here are the reasons given to me by Dr. Kip Rogers the academic officer, and I kid you not, these are why they kept the book in the schools. One, it was not intended as instructional. Two, it's written in a poetic verse, which you heard above, which appeals to struggling readers. So Dr. Rogers, as chief academic officer, if you have struggling readers, I would think that your job should be to develop their minds with this important skill of reading and not to develop their minds with the taste of porn, which is being introduced. The book allowed also another excuse, a mom to talk with her child. I'm sorry, a mom's ability to talk to her child should not be dependent on every other child's having to be exposed to porn. Another reason, teen problems are heavy, so this book helps students feel not so alone as they find representations of themselves. We heard this earlier from librarians. No, Dr. Rogers, this is not how you help stru people struggling emotionally. And finally, the final reason, and these are all the reasons, a parent stated that they could not find, they did not find this book as bad as they thought it would be unbelievable and amazing. So what did I do? I appealed the result to share, school board chair Rye, who was the appeal authority when I submitted the book in May. She promptly ran from her duty to heal the appeal, citing that in July, two months later, after I submitted the challenge, the superintendent changed it, making the, himself the final authority on the book, and he did not grandfather her that right. So Ms. Rye, Dr. Spence works for you. You work for us. The presence of this pornographic peddling in the schools is a direct reflection on you, the chair, and all who allow it to remain. Thank you. Next speaker is Jerome Bell. Please unmute. Good evening, Mr. Bell. Good evening, me. Thank you for having me. Uh, hey, I'm an advocate for children. I work with agencies like the Underground Railroad to put an end to child sex trafficking and understanding what is and what is not grooming is essential. And the material in these books that uh, Superintendent Spence and the school board, uh, which allows the pornographic material to be in, in our school, is in fact grooming kids for the school to prostitution pipeline. The school board, through Spence, then limited the ability of parents and these citizens to challenge these, the presence of these books, as Spence and the board majority are comfortable with these grooming books. Now read excerpts from them. 
first from the perks of being a wallflower available in high schools and several middle schools in the system. And I will not be using safe words because our children are in danger and they are not safe. On page 30, after a few minutes, the boy pushed the girl's head down and she started to kiss his penis. She was still crying. I'm Finally, so she me. stopped. Mr. Bell, I have to remind you of the bylaw prohibition against uh, the profanity. I'm reclaiming my time. A penis is not profan uh, profanity. A penis is actually a anatomically correct description of a male's genitals. That is not profanity. Thank you very much. Finally, she stopped crying because he put his penis in her mouth. And I don't think you can cry in that position. I had to stop watching at that point because I started to feel sick, but it kept going on and they kept doing things. And she kept saying, no, yes, this is in some of our middle schools. Page 44. When most people left, Brad and Patrick went into Patrick's room. They had sex for the first time that night. And I will say that Brad assumed the role of the girl in terms where you put things. When they were finished, Brad started to cry really hard. Page 21. Do you know what masturbation is? I would tell you, masturbation is when you rub your genitals until you have an orgasm. Wow. I thought that in these movies and television shows, when they talk about having a coffee break, they should have a masturbation break. Fade by Lisa McMahon, available in some middle schools and high schools, addresses overt sexual activities which occurs in these schools. Uh, stumbling, Janie bumps against the door. It opens and Mr. Durbin is on the bed. There are three girls from his class with him. He is taking off their clothes. I'm running out of time, so I'm going to skip to this. Recently, a Virginia Beach School a public librarian spoke to defend some of the various books which parents mm -hmm. and citizens disapprove of, arguing the books should remain as they mirror the real experiences of students. I certainly hope not. Chair Rye and Vice Chair Melink, you and your school board must accept your personal responsibility. Relieve Spence from any authority over the porn peddling going on in our schools, or you too are porn peddlers. Actually, you should just simply remove Spence for the sake of our children. Thank you very much. Our next speaker is Virginia Wassenberg. Please unmute. Good evening, Ms. Wasserberg. Good evening. The school board, through the superintendent, allows pornographic grooming material in VBCPS. When parents and citizens challenge these materials, VBCPS administration and some school board members worked to limit the ability of parents and citizens to challenge them. Mrs. Rye and Mrs. Melnick, why are you promoting porn peddling in schools? The book called Sex is a Funny Word is available to children in VBCPS. While I personally find the material inappropriate for my children's friends, however, Mrs. Holtz has told me she believes children deserve the choice to have this material made available to them. So the passages that I will read from this book and others contain potentially controversial words that I will replace with the word dotty or Holtz. On page 107, it reads, quote, we touch ourselves all the time in all kinds of places for all kinds of reasons. Touching yourself is one way to learn about yourself, your body and your feelings. You may have discovered that touching some parts of your body, especially in the middle parts, can make you feel warm and tingly. Grownups call this cut kind of touching dotty bait. Dotty bait is when we touch ourselves usually our middle parts, to get that warm and tingly feeling. Like other holes in our body, the anus is usually very sensitive, which means it can feel good to touch, but can also hurt if we're rough with it. On page 66 are images of male genitalia and various states of arousal. Page 106 is about touching yourself. The illustration on the top right of the page depicts a woman in a bathtub full of water with her left arm and the water angled toward her pu pubic region as she dotty baits. The book Fade provides children a look at sexual activity between students and teachers. On page 184, it reads, on the way to Mr. Durbin's bedroom, Janie waves at Coach Crater. Hey, she says, turning back to Mr. Durbin. Wasn't Stacy here before? She's still here, Janie. His words are deliberate like he's concentrating. She's halting. Chris is in the other bedroom, so we can halt in here. 
Adults that promote the provision of such pornographic material to children should never be in a position to make decisions about children, and they should never, ever govern the public. We're watching from all over the United States. We're watching you guys hand out poor peddling. I will never cease to speak up and protect innocent children from porn peddlers such as on this board. Our next speaker, Mr. Chang, please unmute. Good evening, Mr. Chang. Dan Chang, please unmute. Can you hear me? Yes. Good evening, Mr. Chang. Yes. Hello. Please proceed. Can you hear me? Doesn't sound like you can hear us. Can you hear us, Mr. Yeah. Chang? Oh, thank you, Ms. Ray. I'm having technical difficulties, believe it or not. Um, okay, you can my, proceed. Has my clock started? Go ahead. Okay, Ms. Ray, Ms. Melnick. Ms. Anderson, Ms. Riggs, Ms. Owens, Ms. Holtz, Ms. Fel Hel Felton, and Ms. Franklin. I want to reiterate the fact that you all, as school board members, took an oath of office, and I believe part of that oath of office is that you will obey the rules of the state. And there are rules in this state about pornography. The first thing I'd like to say is, I know you have abrogated your authority to Superintendent Spence to allow him to break the law by putting these books in the library. I will not read to you excerpts from these books, and I have read some of them, but my question to this board, particularly, have you read any of these books? You sit there and you ask Superintendent Spence to break the law, and he flows it down to uh, Dr. Rogers. Have you read these books? If you had children in the school now, would these types of books be acceptable? I don't think so. Ms. Felton, I believe you're a very Christian lady. What we are reading or what you're seeing here is very unchristian. I'm very surprised that this is something that we would be, it would be acceptable to this school board to have in this school system. We have some very intelligent children that need help. They don't need the help in this realm as to areas that are very graphic. I know the librarian last time said it's good for mirroring. I'm telling you, there are no, there's no mirroring that I would want any of my children or my, or my fr friend's children to have from these books. So my, my request to you all is get your authority back, take control of this. Don't delegate it to Superintendent Spence to break the law for you. Protect our children. Thank you. Our next speaker is Janine Baker. Please unmute. Good evening, Ms. Baker. Thank you. Under Superintendent Spence, using the authority relinquished to him by the school board, pornographic material is allowed in our schools. Parents and citizens challenged many books, and the response of the superintendent was to keep most of these pornographic books in the system available to our students and then to severely limit the ability of parents and citizens to challenge the presence of these books in our schools. Since the superintendent and the majority of the board appear comfortable with these books, I want to share this with you. But because of many of these readings are so inappropriate, as you've heard already on some of the, on some already, I have some more, for public broadcast to adults that they do in fact violate FCC regulations. So I will just give you a synopsis. Not only are pornographic books available in Virginia Beach schools, there is at least one school that is encouraging these explicit books to be checked out of this on the school's Instagram page. The page is called Marlin LMC. This page recommends sexually explicit books such as Last Night at the Telegraph Club, which describes in great detail two girls performing sexual acts on one another and getting pleasure out of it. Another book recommended on the page is called Out of Darkness that describes in great detail a father raping his daughter and making his son watch. This book also describes in sexual um, detail, ac detailed acts between minors. Another book shown on the same Instagram page is a book called Flamer, which shows graphics of a child who has just pleased himself and kept the evidence in a bottle. It also discusses the child watching his father's porn and getting pleasure of it. 
by the way, there are screenshots and video of the entire Instagram page. People need to be accountable. Yes, these books were not only available in the library, but it appears that they are being recommended by the libraries and the school. Some librarians keep coming to these school board meetings to defend these books. I want to remind the people that the majority of the school board are comfortable with these books available to children. But last year, when a parent held up pictures from one of the books, Carolyn Rye turned the cameras off. When a grandparent read from another one, Carolyn Rye turned off her mic. You are intentionally withholding material from the people that you want our children to have access. Why does the majority on this school board continue to defend this pornography? And why does the superintendent change the regulations to make it more difficult to challenge these types of materials? I am against these materials being available to minors and yet takes another whole new level when the school staff is pushing pornography onto children. I'm asking the school board to stand with me against this. Thank you. Is Annie Palumbo, please unmute. Good evening, Miss Palumbo. Evening. Can you hear me? Yes, we can, Miss Palumbo. Good evening. Uh, good evening. I'm back. Did you miss me? Did you guys really just cut Jerome Bell off for saying penis? Aren't these books in our schools? Isn't penis taught in sex ed? What's wrong with you guys? You don't like parents shining the light on you. Well, it's been a while since I've donated my precious time to talk to the school board. But tonight, I've come out of my silence because not saying anything about the porn that's in our schools is equivalent to watching a predator in a public setting showing porn to an underage child and me simply ignoring it. The fact that you allow these disgusting books in our schools makes me wonder if you might be child predators yourself. Tonight, I will read from the book Push by Sapphire. I want the parents to know what Superintendent Spence, school board members Rye, Melnick, Felton, Owens, Anderson, Riggs, Franklin, and my all-time favorite, Dottie Holtz, used to defile the innocent minds of children. I'm going to replace in inappropriate words with a safe word. My safe word was going to be Chairwoman Rye, who leads the school board, but I decided to use words that rhyme with. The book Sapphire, Push by Sapphire, presents to children images to which they should not be exposed. It robs their innocence through graphic sexual activities, including molestation, incest, sexual nudity, excessive frequent profanity, derogatory terms, drug use, violence, and self-harm. The main character is twice impregnated by her dad with two of her dad's babies, first at the age of 12. The book details the father raping his daughter, oral sex, it uses racial slurs such as crackers and then the N-word 22 times, the F-word 84 times, the B-word 47 times. This book is in at least six Virginia Beach high schools. The material in this book is so unsettling that many parts I will not read here because I will be shut down due to FCC rules. Stay tuned, though, because I've got my platform to expose all of you, and I'm going to expose you. I am back. I am back in the game because you know what? Parents don't want their children exposed to this. You know, my child just graduated from high school this summer. Thank God, but I'm still going to fight. So let me read you one excerpt from this book. A child talks about getting pregnant by her father. I don't duck boys, but I'm pregnant. My father ducks me. 30 seconds. She looks at me. I said, I want to suck a dog's rick or some sheep. Daddy put his pee-pee smelling thing in my mouth, my wussy, but never hold me. I hate to hear him talk more than I hate to duck. Sometimes duck feels good. And then sadly, this character says they hate themselves. Sadly, ladies and gentlemen, these are the people you elected to protect your children. You know what? November's three months away. Vote them out, baby. Vote them out. Have a good night. Our next speaker is Becky Hay. Please unmute. Good evening, Ms. Hay. Good evening. Can you hear me? Yes, ma'am. Okay, thank you. Under the authority of Dr. Spence and his administration, due to responsibility relinquished by this board, inappropriate pornographic material continues to be allowed in our school libraries. Once more, the taxpaying members of our community can no longer challenge these materials based on recent policy changes made by Dr. Spence. This past spring, I challenged three books using the process. I also emailed documentation to the board. Almost none of the board acknowledged my email. Given the graphic nature of what I sent, I was quite disappointed. I'm not sure if it's because most of the boards did not, the board did not respond because they didn't think it was part of their job as an elected member or if they were okay with what they read. 
I had excellent conversation with Dr. Paula Johnson at Lansdowne High School in this process, and I also received a respectful phone call from Dr. Rogers. Two of the three books I challenged were permanently removed from Virginia Beach schools. However, one book still remains per administration based on re the review of committees, the review committee's recommendations. Since the board and administration are comfortable with this book, I want to read just two condensed excerpts from the haters. Well, I don't know, but it looks like jizz. Wes, true or false? That's your jizz in our sink. Shut up about Wes jizzing in the sink. Rinsing isn't always enough to get it all the way out of the sink. I just figured it wasn't awkward because I'd masturbated into the hotel sink. Corey, can we talk oral sex technique a little? I'm never gonna improve without your feedback, so please give it to me straight. You know, slow it down, I mean way down. Okay, just really simplify what you're doing. I'm general, in general, try to make circles with your tongue. Got it, got it. And no matter what happens, you need to be out of there after five minutes. So those sections aren't even the worst of it. The book also uses the F word 67 times. The review panel stated this was a coming of age book with a male lead that would appeal to boys. There are hundreds of books that fit that description without the graphic language and sex details. Gary Paulson, an award-winning author, has four I can think of off the top of my head. The student on the panel said the language was realistic because of what's heard in the halls. Do we not inspire our students to a higher level of language or more creativity in their vocabulary? We don't give children free reign regarding drinking, movies and theaters, driving cars, voting, and other mature things because they're not ready to handle those things. However, it appears that books are a free-for-all and students should be able to have access to any sort of material because, quote, free speech. This is irresponsible. Any good child psychologist worth their salt knows children desire and need boundaries. Instead of deferring to administration on important topics like this, I would like to see some leadership from this board. Laura Hughes is introducing a, a resolution for parental rights and her proactive leadership is to be commended. I fully support the resolution and it reiterates the historical understanding of in loco parentis regarding the role of public school officials in their submission to parental authority. Passing this resolution will resolve several issues, including pornographic materials, and it will help build the accountability and transparency sorely lacking. Will be um, Daphne Stagg, please unmute. Good evening, Ms. Stagg. Hello, hello, can you hear me? Yes, good evening. <clears throat> good evening. Under Superintendent Spence, the authority relinquished to him by the school board, pornographic material is allowed in our schools. Parents and citizens challenged many books, and the response of the superintendent was to keep most of the pornographic books in the system available to our students, and then to severely limit the ability of parents and citizens to challenge to limit the ability of parents and citizens to challenge the presence of these books in our schools. Since the superintendent and the majority of the school board appear comfortable with these books, I will read to you some of the passages from them. As many of these readings are so inappropriate for public broadcast to adults that they violate FCC regulations, I will replace inappropriate words with a safe word and to honor the work so hard to keep books in our schools a safe word will be melnick your imagination will suffice what words the image placed a book by the title of tricks was recently charged and superintendent d that it was that it should remain libraries this in all Virginia Beach high school to children as young as 13 years old. Here are excerpts. Why would God need a melanic malaria anyway? I have to admit, I have thought about melanic her once. The big melanic probably do it more than I should. And Ronnie is definite Melnick bait, at least when I'm left to my own imagination instead of internet porn, viva la webcams, webcams, hmm. Delirious with raw, raw need, my hand 
wants to slide lower to a place I know nothing about, <laughs> except what they call it in books. And suddenly it comes to me how complete I'll be Andrew and I finally share that warm feather bed with comfy quilts and pillows we can fall into. I turn I go to the to avoid looking at Calvary screen save Jesus hanging on the cross. Mama downloaded yes. that. No doubt specifically to do the this time that more than mutual melnicking. This Madam Chair, that was our last speaker for this evening. Thank you, Madam Clerk. That brings us to the information portion of the evening, and we begin with program evaluation schedule for the coming school year. And welcoming Ms. Janicki, Dr. Janicki, Director of Research and Evaluation. Good evening, Chairwoman Rye, Vice Chair Melnick, members of the school board, and Dr. Spence. I'm Dr. Heidi Janicki, Director of Research and Evaluation. This evening, I will share the proposed schedule of program evaluations that will be conducted during 2022-23 based on school board policy 6-26. Before presenting the evaluation schedule for the upcoming year, I'll provide an overview of the evaluation reports that will be provided in upcoming months based on last year's schedule. The reports that will be provided to the school board this fall based on the 2021-2022 program evaluation schedule are shown on the slide, including the year two final evaluation of the environmental studies program at the Chesapeake Bay Foundation's Brock Environmental Center, the year two evaluation of PBIS with a continued focus on tier one practices, and the evaluation of Achieve 3000, which is a supplemental online literacy program. Additionally, the evaluation plan for alternative education at Renaissance Academy will be shared tonight following this presentation. Finally, based on a recommendation from last year's English as a Second Language program evaluation, an evaluation update will also be provided to the school board. As stipulated by school board policy, the proposed 2022-23 program evaluation schedule that will be shown on the next slide was developed based on evaluation requirements for programs. Based on the policy, new programs or initiatives that operate with local resources are evaluated for a minimum of two years and then during the year of full implementation if a program takes more than two years to implement. In addition, programs that have been previously evaluated may remain on the schedule as a result of an evaluation plan for the program that was previously approved by the school board. Each year, the proposed program evaluation schedule is presented to the superintendent senior staff and the planning and performance monitoring committee to obtain feedback regarding the recommendations. The proposed evaluation schedule for the upcoming 2022-23 school year will require school board approval. The proposed program evaluation schedule for the upcoming 2022-23 school year is shown on the slide. The year three evaluation of PBIS in 2022-23 will focus on the implementation of advanced tiers two and three of the PBIS framework across the division and will continue to examine outcome data. The gifted resource cluster program evaluation will address aspects of program operation as well as outcomes. The first year evaluation of alternative education at Renaissance Academy will focus on program operation and baseline data for student outcomes. More information about the evaluation plan for alternative education will be shared in the next presentation. In addition, the evaluation of Canvas, a learning management system will begin during the initiative's first year of implementation across the division. And this concludes the presentation of the program evaluation schedule for the upcoming school year. I'm available for any questions at this time. Thank you. Any questions, ladies? All right, we thank you. So our second information item of the evening is Renaissance Academy uh, Evaluation Readiness Report. And we welcome Dr. Noel Williams, Program Evaluation Specialist. 
Good evening, Chair Rye, Vice Chair Melnick, members of the school board, and Dr. Spence. I'm Dr. Noelle Williams, a program evaluation specialist in the Office of Research and Evaluation. Today, I will present the Renaissance Academy Alternative Education Evaluation Readiness Report, including background information, goals and objectives, and the recommended evaluation plan. As a brief background, in 1993, the school board adopted policy 627, which states in part, the school boy realizes that the needs of all of our students cannot be met within the formal school curriculum. Therefore, the school board encourages alternative education experiences that will enhance a student's learning and which will increase students' ability to achieve success in the world of work. The policy also states that alternative education programs will be provided where the needs have been identified and where the establishment of such programs is feasible. In 1998, a five-year alternative education comprehensive plan was adopted to support students' educational and personal needs. Two years later, in 2000, a task force was appointed to review the five-year comprehensive plan to enhance services. Since that plan's inception, the alternative education program options available for students have evolved, but have each maintained their focus on meeting students' needs. Renaissance Academy opened in 2010 for students in grades 6 through 12. The Renaissance Academy alternative education program seeks to meet the needs of students who are not experienced success in regular secondary settings. The program offers students different opportunities to best meet their needs when traditional education interventions do not effectively remedy students' behavior and or academic difficulties. Students in this program participate in general curriculum courses at the Renaissance Academy. The length of time a student remains enrolled in Renaissance Academy can vary, and students may be referred through the Office of Student Leadership, principals, or due to scheduling needs. The evaluation readiness process and proposed evaluation plan focused on the Renaissance Academy alternative education program for these enrolled students. It is worth noting that there are other additional alternative education options within VBCPS that are specific to students' unique needs, and these are listed on the slide. Some of these options have been evaluated previously, and they are not a part of this specific evaluation plan. Based on school board policy, the purpose of the evaluation readiness process is to prepare existing programs or initiatives for evaluation after they are selected for, from the, for the annual program evaluation schedule. The process leads to a recommendation regarding the evaluation plan. The school board approved last year's program evaluation schedule in which the Renaissance Academy Alternative Education Program was recommended for an evaluation readiness report to refine measurable goals and objectives. Program evaluation staff have reviewed historical and current documentation related to alternative education and relevant literature. The Evaluation Readiness Committee, consisting of the principal at Renaissance Academy, the school's data analyst, and program evaluation and school leadership staff, developed division-wide goals and objectives focused on student outcomes. Finally, a proposed evaluation plan was developed for upcoming school years. As a result of the evaluation readiness process, four goals and 18 objectives were developed with assistance from the Renaissance Academy staff. The first goal is that students participating in the alternative education program at Renaissance Academy build relationships that help them demonstrate social emotional competencies. Specific objectives for this goal include students building positive relationships with other students and staff, students feeling a sense of belonging at Renaissance Academy, and students demonstrating competency in relationship skills, self-management skills, and responsible decision-making skills. The next two goals focus on students in alternative education demonstrating success while attending Renaissance Academy, as well as when they transition back to their home school. The second goal focuses on students demonstrating success while attending Renaissance Academy. Specific objectives for this goal include students gaining the tools and strategies they need to demonstrate success in school, a decline in discipline referrals and referrals resulting in in-school and out-of-school suspensions, consistent school attendance, improved academic performance based on core course grade averages, and academic proficiency based on passing applicable standards of learning tests. 
The third goal focuses on students successfully transitioning back to their home school following enrollment at Renaissance Academy. Specific objectives include students gaining the tools and strategies to successfully transition back to their home school, Students, students demonstrate satisfactory behavior based on discipline referrals that are less than or consistent with their home school's average referral rate, consistent attendance at their home school, and maintaining their academic performance based on core course grade averages. The fourth goal is that students in alternative education will, will graduate and develop a post-graduation plan. Specific objectives include students who attend Renaissance Academy will graduate from high school, Students reporting that the academic career planning process helped them make informed decisions about their future. Students setting goals for their learning and future plans. And students reporting that they have a post-graduation plan. After completing the evaluation readiness process, a three-year evaluation is recommended. Years one and two of the evaluation plan during 2022, 2023, and 2023, 2024 will focus on the operation of the Renaissance Academy Alternative Education Program. Devoting two years of focus to program operation will allow processes to be examined along with any modifications or changes made by the administration. Student outcome data related to the goals and objectives will be analyzed each year. Year three, the evaluation will shift the focus will shift to focusing on program effectiveness in terms of student outcomes and the degree to which the program met its goals and objectives. As noted previously, the evaluation is focused on students enrolled at the Renaissance Academy and participating in the general curriculum. This slide outlines the focus of the evaluation questions during the evaluation period. The evaluation will address operational components, including the purpose of alternative education, the various services provided for Renaissance Academy students, the student referral process and criteria, and the student transition process and criteria for returning to their home school. The other evaluation focus areas each year include the characteristics of students attending Renaissance Academy, staff characteristics, parent family involvement engagement activities, the program's progress towards meeting its goals and objectives, stakeholder perceptions, and costs to the division. This concludes the presentation regarding the evaluation readiness process and the plan for evaluating alternative education at Renaissance Academy. At this time, I want to introduce Mr. James Miller, Director of Alternative Education at Renaissance Academy. We are available for any questions you may have. Thank you. Please add Ms. Franklin to the queue. So I'm sure we'll have a few. All right, this was very uh, thorough and informative and we will start with Mrs. Manning. Thank you. Um, in the beginning, I heard you say that we should prepare students to achieve success in the world of work, I believe is what you said. And um, I was just speaking, I think Ms. Owens and I were speaking just last week uh, with someone who told us that there used to be some sort of vocational training program, I believe, at the Renaissance Academy, but that is not there anymore. Can you elaborate on that and tell me why it's not there anymore? I'm gonna defer to Mr. Miller here. Yeah. I think okay. he better answer your Thank question. Thank you. Sure. Welcome, Mr. Miller. Thank you. Good evening. Um, we are working on bringing those vocational type trainings back to the Renaissance. We have several projects um, we are currently working on. So we are bringing those programs back. Part of the process will be coming up. We have the space. Um, it's a matter of funding and it's also a matter of getting approval to bring back programs that we did have. And some of the items I, I will share with you that we're working on one is beekeeping, so students can actually, we would have bees at our building, and they would be on the roof or in our outside area, and the students would actually receive a certification in beekeeping, which I was surprised at the number of people around the country, that's a, a growing um, mm -hmm. position, and students could actually have that certification and go right into the workforce for that. We are also looking at an, a couple other programs that were at Renaissance that we're planning on trying to bring back, such as a barbershop program. And 
those again, we have the space. It's just a matter of um, process. I've been at Renaissance for one year, and I'm excited to bring these programs back to Renaissance. Great. I'm so glad glad to hear that. Um, is this something that may happen this year, or what, what timeline are we looking at? <laughs> I don't well, know who wants to answer that. I think we'll have to get back to you. It's likely that you'll see some of the requests that have been uh, talked about in the next per round of Perkins grant funding. Okay, thank you. Thank you, Dr. Miller. Thank you. Uh, Mrs. Franklin, go ahead. Well, hello. I um, just want to say that I'm so happy to see all of the great things that are happening there. You know that I am a huge fan of what is uh, is going on at Renaissance and all the good work that you guys are doing. Um, I wanted to just ask, though, do we have any further information about the foreign language um, discussion that we were talking about at the PPMC meeting? Oops, did I lose you? No, we're here. No, oh, ma'am. I um, I apologize. I stepped away from the microphone. I um, we are working on the Spanish bringing Spanish to the Renaissance Academy. At this time, we are offering it virtually, and um, I have spent the last two weeks visiting many of the high schools to talk to the home schools regarding being able to have some of our students attend, remain in their Spanish classes, so they don't lose that credit when and if they come to the Renaissance Academy. And Good. many and of them you, have agreed. Can you just explain to the board how uh, problematic that can be for them to try and, you know, um, go back to their home school and, you know, be behind because of, um, because of their difficulty learning it virtually? Part of the problem, um, Spanish is, of course, if you want an advanced diploma, you need to take foreign language. So again, we are trying to cut back on the time that a student would be out of their home school. So our goal is looking at a nine week period. And when we do our orientations, we now give the student the date that they could first go back. And we go over with them the three things they need to work on, their attendance, their grades, and their discipline. And then we hope to send them back sooner so they will not lose what they've already learned at their home school. Okay, thank you. I just wanted to make sure that the board was clear on um, on that issue. So thank you for that. Yeah, and Mr. Miller, and this could be for other staff too, but this just seems an ideal situation where distance learning could be, should be used. Yes, Mr. Delaney? <laughs> That's correct. We, we look at those options in many of our schools when we don't have the ability to offer based on staffing needs. <clears throat> but again, in world language classes are difficult because even the staffing numbers and the distance learning in the world one, world two languages is sometimes a little more of a challenge. But mm -hmm. we investigate all of those possibilities. We've been doing that for the last, uh, pretty intensely the last two years. Okay. Anybody else? Uh, please, uh, Ms. Weems has her hand raised. Yeah. Go ahead, Mrs. Weems. Thank you. I appreciate this report. I really um, like the bullet of stakeholders' perception. All my colleagues know this is a um, uphill battle, especially during discipline hearings. So I look forward to um, to hearing some sort of um, outline about how how we can, I guess, educate the public about, for instance, some of the things that you said today, Mr. Miller, about the different programs in that building. I think anytime we talk about um, any kind of different type of education, whether it be a recovery school, um, alternative education at the Renaissance Academy, career and tech ed. Um, I think there is somewhat of a stigma there and we've got to somehow educate the public and embrace that these are great programs and these are great opportunities for our students. So at some point, if you could come back and give us kind of a report of what exactly you know, is in that building and the opportunities that you're expanding on, I sure would appreciate it. And I think the public would be amazed. So thank you so much for the good work. Thank you, ma'am. Anybody else? Mrs. Felton. Of course, Mr. Miller. I have to say thank you for all that you're doing. And when I look at goal number four, uh, students in alternative education will graduate and develop a post-graduation plan 
All of those bullets uh, that are listed there is a, I've seen that normal um, display and conversation during graduation as you're calling each student up and you're saying what their goals are going to be, especially with military. We get a lot of students coming through, going through military school, going through military after that. Not only that, we've had a couple of entrepreneurships come out of that as well. So I'm looking forward to seeing more enhancement on that and you're coming back and giving us a grand report on that. If you want to elaborate on that as well. Yes, ma'am. This year we did our own type of graduation and we did have three board members at our graduation, which we were very thankful for. And we actually did our graduation ceremony and we gave each student an opportunity as they walked across the stage. I had three key questions I asked them, what they planned on doing when they left that evening. Um, many of them said go out to dinner, celebrate with family. And then we asked them where they saw themselves in five years. And then we asked them what they wanted to do as a profession for the rest of their life. And all of those students answered. And that's scary to ask some kids those questions. But I think they were, I mean, the count, the school board members that were there, I think they realized that these students really knew what they wanted to do. And they did establish goals and created goals throughout their time at Renaissance and are ready to go out into the world. I just had to say uh, uh, that's what you just said. Uh, yeah, uh, I was there, Ms. Franklin, and Mrs. Holt was there as well. But believe it, when I tell you the lot more of the school board members wanted to be there, but with getting back out into graduation face-to-face, -face, the schedule sort of kind of got scrambled that a bit. So I hope next year uh, it will be more of an opportunity for us to be there, and I would um, really encourage my board members to get to see the unique way that you handle your education. Not only your graduations, not only that, we had a couple of unique uh, students to, to graduate that apparently tragic happened, but you handled them so well. And I just want to say thank you for that. Thank you, ma'am. I appreciate that. All right, to be continued. Best of luck with the opening of the school year. Information item C, we have two policies and two regulations listed here, and we have Dr. Robertson, uh, our Chief of Staff, to present. Good evening. So, so good evening, Chairwoman Ra, Vice Chairwoman Melnick, board members, and Dr. Spence. Tonight I'll share information on how policies and regulations are developed, and specifically the process used for the policies and regulations noted here. The two policies to discuss Tonight are Policy 661, Instructional Materials Selection, Policy 712, Challenge Controversial Materials, and the two regulations to discuss are Regulation 661.2, Review and Challenge of Instructional Materials by Parents, Legal Guardians, and Adult Students, and Regulation 712.1, Complaints from Citizens, Challenge Controversial Curricular Materials. I would point out that these policies and regulations were not slated for review this year, but instead were brought to the attention of the board and administration last fall with the challenge of six books. In this challenge, it was noted the previous policies and regulations were confusing and required review. The development of policy is a key governance role of local school boards. Noted in the Code of Virginia under 221.1-253.137. In our school board language under policies and regulations, it states in part, the school board representing the people of the community is a legislative body which, which determines all questions of general policy to be employed in the conduct of the public schools. Policy is a basic written statement of the intent of the school board which creates rights and responsibilities for the conduct of the division's business. The board manages policy developments through a formal process, which includes using a policy review committee to oversee the process. The PRC is comprised of three board members who complete annual terms. With support from the school board attorney, chief of staff, and the coordinator of policy and intergovernmental affairs. 
The PRC meets monthly to review policies designated for review as required by law, as well as to review policy, policies such as 661 and 712 that the board has deemed need an off-cycle review. The PRC reviews those policies brought forward, makes recommendations and the policies that are approved by the PRC, then go to the full school board as part of information for review and discussion. In the subsequent meeting, the school board then formally votes on policy revisions in the consent or action portion of the agenda. Approved policy changes are immediately posted on the inter and intranet school board SharePoint site and sent to all staff via division email. Policy 661 instructional material selections has a legal basis in the Code of Virginia under 22.1-238. The policy was recommended for an addition to a PRC agenda in April and on May 12th, the PRC reviewed the proposed changes and voted three to zero to move the revisions to information in the upcoming school board meeting. On May 24th, the school board reviewed changes to 661 and on June 13th, these changes were approved nine to zero by board members present. As noted in the last slide, we communicated the changes to staff via division email and posted the new policy on the inter and intranet and school board SharePoint site. You have a red line version of the approved changes in your packet. Key changes to policy 661 included adding specific language to clarify those print and digital materials used as part of the course curriculum for teacher assigned materials and also the removal of the editor's note. Policy 712, Challenge Controversial Materials, was recommended for an addition to a PRC agenda in April and re was reviewed by the PRC on May 12th and again on June 9th. On June 9th, the PRC reviewed and the, and the proposed changes, I'm sorry, on June 9th, the PRC reviewed the proposed changes and voted 2-0 to zero to move the revisions to information in the upcoming school board meeting. On June 28th, the school board reviewed changes to Policy 712 and on June uh, on, on, and on July 12th, under consent, these changes were approved 10 to 0 by board members present. Again, as noted in the last slide, we communicated these changes uh, to staff via division email, posted the new policy on the inter and intranet, and school board SharePoint site. You also have a red line version of the approved changes in your packet. Key changes to 712 included adding a paragraph noting that Regulation 661.1 and 661.2 would govern procedures for challenging materials by parent, legal guardians, and adult students, while Regulation 712.1 would govern procedures for challenging materials by citizens without children in Virginia Beach City Public Schools. And then finally, the editor's note was also removed. Whereas policies fall under the purview and authority of the school board establishing regulations designed to support board approved policies falls under the purview and authority of the superintendent. In our policies and regulations homepage, it states this authority. A regulation is the detailed manner or method of written implementation of policy delegated by the board to the superintendent. To do this, the division has developed a process to review and revise regulations. Key players in this process include the school board attorney, chief of staff, coordinator policy and intergovernmental affairs, and the chief officer with oversight of the particular regulation in question. Anytime a policy is changed by the school board, the supporting regulations are then reviewed to make any necessary revisions to support the intent and language within the new policy. In addition, when there are changes to federal or state law or VDOE guidelines, regulations may need to be revised that are not part of any policy change. Most often this occurs in the departments of, departments of Human Resources, Teaching and Learning, and School Leadership as a result of changes made through the Virginia Department of Education or the Virginia Department of Health. Final authority of approved changes to regulations rests with the Chief of Staff as a superintendent's designee and school board attorney for legal sufficiency. When regulations are changed, we communicate this out to all division staff affected by the change, update the regulations on the inter and intranet, and we have now added a link to the school board SharePoint site. 
With changes to po uh, policy 661 approved by the board on June 13th, division administration had begun drafting re revisions to regulation 661.2 that would support the changes to policy 661. These revisions were approved by the chief of staff taking effect on June 15th. The changes to the regulation were communicated out to affected division staff and personnel, postal and, inter and intranet, and have now been added to the school board SharePoint site. You have the red line version in your packet. Key changes including, included designated that 661.2 governed how parent, legal guardians, and adult students could challenge instructional materials. It added specific timelines and procedures for both school personnel and complainants. Further, it clarified what appeals would be heard at the school board level and how that appeal process would work. In the case of what appeals would be heard by the school board, the regulation notes that only appeals related to instructional materials would be heard by the school board appeals committee. This means that certain ancillary resources not part of a student's instructional course materials would not be reviewed by the school board. With changes to policy 712 approved by the board on July 12th, division administration had begun drafting re revisions to regulation 712.1 that would support the changes to policy 712. These revisions were approved by the chief of staff taking effect on July 13th. The changes to the regulations again were communicated out to affect the division staff and school personnel posted on the internet and have been added to the school board SharePoint site. And you have the red line version in your packet. Key changes included that only materials prescribed as part of the required course curriculum could be challenged by citizens without children in Virginia Beach City Public Schools. This means that certain ancillary resources would not be subject to a challenge. This decision was to promote the rights of parents, legal guardians, or adult students to supersede the interests of a citizen without children in Virginia Beach City Public Schools. Further changes to Regulation 712.1 closed the appeals level at the division level and does not allow for any challenges to the school board. In review, based on a 9-0 approval vote for policy 661 and a 10-0 approval vote for policy 712 by this board, we believe the reason this item was added tonight to information centers on the changes made to the two accompanying regulations. I am prepared to answer any questions, questions related to the development of or language used in either regulation. No, it is critically important that any regulation be crafted in a means that meets the intent and language of school board approved policies. And we believe this has been done with both 661.2 and 712.1. However, if the will of the board is different, changes will be considered. Ms. Linetti is also available to answer questions, any questions related to any legal matters. Thank you, Dr. Robertson. We'll begin with Mrs. Manning. Thank you. First, um, Madam Chair, I'd like to thank you for allowing um, my request to, to have this on the agenda um, and, and for putting it on there. So thank you for doing that. Um, one, one bylaw that wasn't mentioned here is one that um, Ms. Linetti uh, told me about. I don't have the exact number, but it's bylaw 1-something um, that uh, gives the authority of the school board to overturn the superintendent's regulations to change it, correct, Ms. 130. Linetti? 130? 133 allows you, what, what 133 says is that generally you're only going to approve or about a, a regulation required to by state or federal law, but there's a second second that says review that if the school board as a whole decides you need to look at when you have that right, but you would have to vote on it. But it's right. normally you would not do that. It, right, but it is, most the bylaw 1-33 gives us the authority to, to change it. Um, and on the policy changes, when, when I voted for these changes to this policy um, here in 7-12, it was just clarifying that um, the regulations 6-61 would govern uh, parents and guardians and then regulation 712 would govern challenging materials. I had no idea that there would be such um, huge changes to this. And you referenced some dates here. Um, that it was uh, the new regulation went into effect on July 13th for 7-12.1. But when I found out, when I discovered these changes a few weeks ago, 
um, I went on to the, the website and discovered them. I printed it out. And if you go on the website right now, the red line versions of it, it still says it. It says that it was revised on June 14th, 2022. However, the document I've been given tonight says July 12th. It's the same document, but on the website, it says June 14th. And when I looked at this several weeks ago and printed it out, it said June 14th. So I'm not sure how um, the revisions got changed um, by a month, um, a little over a month. Um, when and, and why that is. So I wanted to point that out. Um, so, um, you know, you're talking about you want parents to have the authority, and I, I understand that and I agree with that. However, we have so many things that we give citizens input <coughs> on. When we have family life education, we allow any citizen of the city to come in and, and review it and be a part of it and give feedback on it. When we have new textbooks, we have citizens coming in, reviewing it, coming in, giving us feedback on it. When we have construction, new school construction, we're getting ready to do that, we're going to have um, committees come in, and it's going to be made of citizens, not just parents. When we have the budget, we consider the citizens' viewpoint, not just parents. School start times, the community was a big part of that. The school calendar, the community was a big part of that. Grading practices, the community was a big part of that, even though they didn't have children in the schools. We've always considered citizen input and not just parents. The citizens of this city, their tax dollars, are paying for these very explicit, and I do call them pornographic, books in our library, such as the Saga series that, thank God, was removed. Our taxpayers paid for that, but now, because you've changed these regulations, neither I nor our citizens can challenge that pornographic book that has since been taken out of our libraries, thanks to my ability to be able to challenge it. But I, I don't have that ability anymore because this board has allowed the superintendent to take away that authority of me, an elected school board member. Um, I have asked, um, I, I asked Ms. Riggs uh, as the policy committee chair uh, a couple of months ago. I gave her some ideas that I had on how we might be able to approach this topic that perhaps could garner support from everyone. I proposed a rating system. A lot of schools use that in their libraries, a rating system. And I'm not asking for all the, all the library books um, to be reviewed. But I asked for any book that's, that has been challenged and any new book coming into our system have a rating on it, just like a movie has a rating on it. And if it's rated NC-17, like a movie that someone under 18 wouldn't be able to go to, that a parent would have to give permission for a child to read those books. I'm trying to give very reasonable answers to these problems. It's been several months. I know Ms. Riggs was waiting for the um, new model policies to come out and instructional materials, but those are out now. Um, I would like to ask the policy committee if you could take these regulations and talk about them in your committee and, and how it li limits citizens, whereas in other areas of our division, we don't li limit citizens' input. Um, so I'm requesting that the Policy Review Committee take a look at Regulation 7.12-1. Um, and you know another, another part of, of, that, of it that was drastically changed in 6-61.12 is the ability of parents to appeal the decisions to the school board um, that was once there and it's not there anymore. So um, that's what I wanted to say. Um, that's why I asked for this to be on the agenda um, so that we could talk about it as a board um, and to try to come up with solutions that hopefully we could all agree on. Thank you. Mrs. Riggs. I just want to say, um, as the chair of the Policy Review Committee, we generally, and this is what we have been doing since we started the Policy Review Committee, I believe it's been how many years now? Seven? Yeah, I've been on it for five years anyway, I think. Um, we look at the policies. We handle the policies and proceed to go over the policies, review those, present them to the school board and vote on those. 
and the regulations are handled by the administration. We give the regulations, we give the overall policy, which gives them the guidelines towards their regulations. So that's what we've done. And that's what we've always done. Um, not just since we've been on the board, but this has been protocol for many, many, many years, um, where the superintendent and his administrators handle the regulations. So we don't look at the regulations normally. And, and there's a reason for that. I'd like for you to weigh in on that, either Ms. Linetti or Generally, Dr. Generally, school board by law is required. There's certain types of regulations that are very limited. Use it student discipline, you'll see that. So those areas you will look at. The regulations occasionally it's required in, when we look at some of the non-discrimination, we're required by the federal government to have a regulation that you would approve. Other than that, it's generally not something we normally bring to you. You're direct, they take the policy and they develop the regulation consistent with that. I'll also mention bylaw 133 reads, the school board itself shall formulate and approve or revise regulations only when specific state or federal mandates require school board approval, such as with the discipline piece, and may do so when the superintendent so recommends in light of strong community attitudes or probable staff reaction. So we are following the bylaws and we're following the stated board language around policies and regulations. That's just an explanation of that. Can I just respond to that? Thank you. Um, so, you know, if it's, if, if this is the, I asked Ms. Linetti about it and perhaps I misunderstood. I thought it meant that we could um, look at those regulations, but if we can't, I would like to ask that we change the policy um, to uh, to govern how books are challenged, um, rather than just giving that authority to the superintendent. Your bylaw would allow the school board as a whole to make a decision that you want to look at certain regulations that are, don't normally fall under your jurisdiction. So, if the entire board, pursuant to 133, wants to do that, you would can. that be a majority of the board? Would that be the whole board? Majority. I okay. The majority of the board. So, I mean, I don't know what the appropriate path would that be to send it back to policy for you all to consider it, or should I bring an agenda item? Um, at, a, at a school board meeting, Ms. Rye or, or Ms. Riggs, what would be the appropriate mechanism? Well, if we could, if I may, I think let's hold that thought a moment. Um, I, I've thought long and hard about this, and, and this is where my understanding lies with respect to library books that are not part of the curriculum, so the non-curricular library books. So for citizens to challenge these books, uh, it, it comes down to, again, we, we had the workshop earlier about parent options for, uh, for their children, but for citizens to challenge to remove books would be to remove them for all families. So do these citizens speak for all families? And we've, we've covered, Dr. Rogers and Dr. Shoebridge covered quite extensively, and they're gonna follow up on a few extra suggestions about the options of parents to, to limit books in the library for their children. So I'm trying to, to think to myself, what, it, what for me would be the rationale or the point of allowing a citizen to challenge to get a book removed from the school library, thus removing it for all families and taking away the rights of certain other families or students when that the option is there for families to again, limit or set parameters for their own children. So, just wanted to throw that out there. I'd like, Mrs. Riggs. Um, um, we were given um, the state recommendations and they were, they were received, we were talking about tonight, Dr. Rogers and, and uh, all of that was given in our workshop which we had been waiting for and looking at. I think we're following what the state has required us to do. No, let me make clear, those are not finalized. They're yet. not We've finalized, the but so far that's the we guidance. We know generally what it's going to say, but they're not finalized yet. Okay, um, have you heard when? There are approximately 2,000 comments that they need to go through and some that's very common in, in the regulatory procedure for them to make changes based on that. 
However, what we saw in the transgender policy is there were about six or 7,000 comments and they chose not to implement any of them. We anticipate that they will be getting back to us. They do know that uh, the expectation is that these your policies will have to be in place by January 1st, and my guess is they're going to have to do fairly quickly with that. But I've certainly seen regulations that have taken 12 years or longer to get through because of the comments. I expect that these will be defined quicker than that, and I don't know that they will look that different, but I can't tell you that they're finalized yet. Okay, and so what I'm asking you, Ms. Manning, is, is let's see what else they're sending to us, because I have no problem looking over that and, and taking that into consideration i don't know about the the rest of the board um um but i would like to see because that is a lot of information that they'll be looking at and who who knows what they might be sending to us so uh, that's my thoughts on it just okay yes and if i could just elaborate quickly because uh, i appreciate that you remind us that you pointed out all the areas and that we uh are open for public input. And so I think this is no different. There is, it, for me, I'm thinking here, a distinction between input and challenge. And nobody is taking away the opportunity for citizens to provide input into any books we have in our libraries. The, the question is, uh, again, is the, right, is the option gonna be afforded them to challenge? So. For some, that's a distinction. For others, I understand it may not be, but I just wanted to point that out as well. So, Mrs. Manning. So, yeah. So, if um, if the citizens had input in the li in the library books that were chosen, I would agree with that. But citizens don't have input into how their tax dollars are being spent on these very pornographic. I mean, the book that I challenged that was in my son's school had graphic images of pictures of orgies and different sexual positions. And I don't know what other books are out there. You know, I, I when I have time, I, I try to look through and see what it is. But I've found 65 books that are, in my opinion, pornographic in nature. And um, I just, I, I mean, I, I can't even talk about them here because I'm not allowed <laughs> to, to even say what's in them. And so I just, I, I think that the taxpayers who are paying for these pornographic books to be given to minors deserve at the very least um, Mrs. the, Mrs. Uh, the, Manning, the I'm ability sorry. to challenge I'm just going to have to jump them. in. You need to stop saying as a board member that we are giving pornography to minors. So you don't, because it's you not don't think that the book Saga was pornographic? I am saying to you that the definition of pornography and the distinction between that and explicit materials, which can be found in some libraries, and we can agree or disagree on whether or not they're good books or not good books, and, and I don't agree that all those books should be there, and I understand that, and I also understand the legal precedent and the need for intellectual freedom and the First Amendment and all the other things that weigh into these decisions, but you will stop saying that my staff I will not is stop. giving pornography to I children. Will not, it does I did not say not they were giving happen. it to them. I said there it is pornographic in the library. You said we are giving I will pornography not stop. to children. I will not stop. We also need to clarify that these are library books and not curriculum. Correct. And so it's a choice that parents don't know about. I didn't know about Thank it as a parent. Right. Thank you. We have Mrs. Mrs. Linetti, do you care to weigh in or we just go to Mrs. Weems? I think you go to Mrs. Weems. These Mrs. Are Weems. Are handled in another matter. Mrs. Weems, you're on. Okay, thank you. Um, yeah, with the citizens, I mean, I don't see much difference um, in input because I think challenging a book is a form of input. Um, the citizens, we, I mean, we want to engage the community. We, um, we, and we try to do that in so many, in just multiple ways. That's, I mean, Ms. Manning already you know, suggested and listed multiple ways. Um, the taxpayer, you know, the citizens, over half their tax taxes are funding all this. And whether you have children or not in the school system, I mean, a lot of these citizens have grandchildren in the school system. A lot of the citizens have children that have just graduated. 
or the citizens who have four-year-olds that are going to enter the school system. And I just um, don't think that that's, that's fair to limit that, um, you know, at all. And, and these citizens have the ultimate input of voting on you and me to represent them, but yet they can't. Are you still with us? Yeah, it just doesn't seem mm -hmm. fair. It doesn't seem right that we're just choosing this for you know to limit them. So I just input, and I want to include all citizens, whether you have children in the school system or not. I think that's important. Thank you. Ms. Franklin has her hand raised. Thank you, Mrs. Franklin. I actually um, do agree that we should allow citizens because we allow them to speak to us, you know, in the meetings. I do have a question though, because um, we had a committee and I, I think this is where I'm getting a little bit confused. At one point we had a committee that was comprised of a, I believe a library media specialist, a parent, a student, um, and then we had a, a committee of school board members. Um, what is the protocol right now if a book is challenged? Are we which, which direction are we going in terms of of um, determining, uh, you know, if the book is going to remain in the in the libraries or in the school? So that's my that's my first question. Sure. So 661.2 outlines the process if you're a parent, legal guardian, or adult student. And it, taught, it starts at the school level where uh, many times those situations can be resolved. I mean, at this particular point, we've had 16 challenges over the last nine months. And in the previous 10 years, I think we had one. Um, at the division level, should the, should the complaint not be uh, uh, an agreement with the decision at the school level, when they go to the division level, then the chief academic officer has spelled out in 661.2 take specific actions to establish uh, committees to review the books. All the committee members have to read all of the books. They have to have multiple meetings about the books, and they have to render a decision. There's a compos composition of those uh, committees to ensure you have a parent, you have a student, you have a citizen, and you have uh, someone representing uh, the division. And for parents and legal guardians, if that that challenge material is instructional in nature, then it can get appealed to the school board. Uh, if that challenge is related to a library material not instructional in nature, then it cannot get challenged to the, to the school board because, again, at that point, you would be superseding the, right, the wishes of a parent over another parent if you make the decision to remove a choice material for all students. For citizens, it's, it's, there is no challenge for citizens um, to challenge library books that are not part of the prescribed curriculum. Citizens uh, have an interest in the, the curriculum that kids are required to, to uh, participate in learning because it is important to Virginia Beach City Public Schools and the entire city that the things that we are providing for our students to learn are the, the most appropriate things and align to the state curriculum. And I think you guys don't need to look any further than the beginning of this meeting when Ms. Rye talked about the performance of our students last year in, in comparison to not only divisions in the 757, but some of the most recognized, highly performing divisions in the entire Commonwealth. And there's a lot of evidence that indicates and should give trust that the administration knows what we're doing in this area. And uh, so there are two different policies related to this appeal, Ms. Franklin. I hope that answered your question. Okay. Well, thank you for clarifying because I, I was just a little bit confused about, you know, because I, I know that we also had a committee of um, school board members as well. Um, so I wasn't, I couldn't remember which, which uh, was appropriate for, for um, the different situations. But um, with that said, I mean, I, we, you know, just in terms of the workshop that we had, I really thought that, you know, this new um, instructional uh, or the, the book policy, the, um, 
hold on, what was that? Uh, the, the instructional materials notification process. I think that is going to be very helpful for parents to have some options. Um, and I, I, I like what Ms. Owen said that, you know, parents, I would absolutely recommend your children have the ability to view what the what library books were um, checked out. I would have you sit down with the, the your kids and ensure that you are um, actively being a part of what they are checking out and, and, and viewing. Um, and certainly there is plenty of um, information out there either on social media or um, via, you know, just watching school board meetings and that sort of thing. Um, and I and I would ask you to make sure that you understand what is out there and go through the, the process um, that is now in place to ensure that you that you have uh, the books that in front of your children that you want and are appropriate for your family. So I do want to make sure that you know that we are actively pursuing um, parental parental involvement in all areas, and that includes sitting down with your children, looking, um, in, you know, with them to see what they're checking out, and and that is a good opportunity for you to know exactly what your children are viewing. So I just wanted to make that comment. Thank you. Dr. Rogers, you you covered. Uh, the 656 model policy in the workshop and I'm going I, I'm looking at that again here in the Senate bill 656 and it, it might be worth asking you to just reiterate for us so I could read it here what it says and what it doesn't say um, but the purpose of the Senate bill that we've been discussing is to ensure parental notification of any instructional material that includes sexually explicit content and include information, guidance, procedures, and standards relating to, and there are three bullets here, parental notification, directly identifying the specific instructional material and sexually explicit subjects, and then permitting the parent of any student to review instructional material that includes on and on. And it ends with the sentence, the provisions of the act shall not be construed as requiring or providing for the censoring of books in public elementary and secondary schools. So again, I can speak just for myself that because we had a full hour discussion on this model policy and what and the division's been working hard this summer to uh, respond to it and the and the guidelines the like the likely guidelines uh, again for for me for some and not for others obviously this seems to address the issue um, Mrs. Hughes. Yeah, I, you know, as far as excluding the public at large, I, I think it's unconscionable to ask the public to keep their wallets open and their mouths closed. I have a real problem with that. Um, I also wanted to address Ms. Melnick's comment that it's only library books and not curriculum. That doesn't make it less damaging. You still have people who have an influence over your children because you want your children to look up to their teachers, their principals, their librarians, and these books are still being given by them. And, and finally, Dr. Spence, you have way overstepped your bounds when you tell board members what they will and will not say. You work for the board and the board works for the public, and that was completely inappropriate on your part. Mrs. Anderson. So it's my understanding, just to be clear, and for the public to be clear, that parents can challenge any book, <laughs> library, instructional, whatever. To a point, yes. Correct. They can, they can issue a challenge for the, for the book. Correct. For whatever reason. Um, Correct. And there are guidelines that, that they need to follow if they're going to challenge a book. Um, the general public also has the opportunity to challenge instructional materials, which are basically books that are um, the, the staff, teachers and staff are asking students to read. 
That's so, correct. Right. So where where we have a pro where where it's limited here for the general public, if you don't have students in our school system, is that they those people cannot challenge library books, which are not being given to our students. Those are books that are available for checkout by choice. Right. That's correct. So, um, you know, I, I don't like the color orange, but I'm not going to tell everybody in Hall of Virginia Beach that they can't wear the color orange just because I don't like it. Because that, but it's my choice. That's my choice. I don't like it, but I'm not, I can't prohibit everybody from using the color orange or painting their house orange or whatever. So I think the, the distinction here is that to tell the general public, um, you know, they have the right to, to, you know, determine what our students have for um, reading purposes when it comes to instruction, but they don't have the right to tell everybody that a book in a library um, can be used. So, uh, because a library is where it's for choice. And as was pointed out in our workshop earlier this afternoon, um, Dr. Rogers, um, if you would just reiterate real quick uh, in just a synopsis real quick about what you told us, or are you getting ready to do that shortly? You're, if you would just reiterate that real quickly for um, you know how, how we can follow that so that um, people know that you know we're not limiting what the public can do but basically we're just telling the public you know hey you don't have the choice of the, the, the right to tell everybody that they can't do something um, so you know kids can pick up uh, the computer and go to anything they want and you know, we can't. We really can't control what they see or don't see, except when they're in our our schools. So, Dr. Rogers, if you just quickly reiterate what you said earlier. Of course, parent partnerships with the classroom, relative to our being in alignment with Senate Bill six five six, is such that our teachers will notify families ahead of time at least 14 days in advance if there is going to be something taught that we've identified as being sexually explicit. A form will be sent home to parents in the form of an email where they'll fill out a form and it will also be sent home in hard copy so that parents will know ahead of time on whether or not they want their children to participate in that particular reading or not. Should they not want their child to participate in that reading, then we will provide for them an alternative. That's mm -hmm. in the classroom. Relative to uh, library partnerships, there are two ways in which we will work with our families relative to library materials that are deemed uh, instructional materials, the first of which, well, or not, the first of which we are working with our families to allow them to place limits on choice selection. So families will have the opportunity to submit a form to our library media specialist where they will be able to restrict the book title the author uh, and or a book series and we will flag that in our library management system called destiny and families will have the opportunity to have that placed in a child's uh, queue and thrift folder so we'll track them from school to school so we'll have that information and the other way in which we will work with our families is to give them the opportunity to review library material prior to their instructional use for example if a teacher brings a group of students to the library and they want to select a particular book that's normally a choice book but that book would be used in conjunction with an instructional assignment then the library media specialist will tell that student that uh, we have to notify your parent and we have to communicate with them via uh, email and get it in writing and share that you know your child would like to check out this book um, and in order for them to check that book out, we have to have parent permission in order for them to do so. We, we will not let that child check that uh, book out unless we have that. And um, those are the two ways, well, three ways in which we will communicate uh, with our families. And as I shared earlier today, that uh, our families will have uh, access to a list of books that we've identified as sexually explicit. And uh, we will certainly make that information available to all our families via our website and other means of communication as we work through with our, our school-based staff. Thank you. Sir. And also, it was pointed out by Ms. Owens earlier that 
you can um, sit with your student as your student can pull up Destiny and you can actually see through your, your student's computer what, what books your child has checked out. Um, so that the student, can, you can ask your child. So if you're really, you want to have, you know, input into your student and you want to monitor what they're doing, have them pull up Destiny. They can do that. And you can sit there, you can see what library book your child has or your student has checked out. So there's that also. Okay, well, I was going to say we have Ms. Owens, Mrs. Holtz, and Mrs. Hughes. And also please add Ms. Weems and Ms. Franklin. All right, so who was first? At, Ms. Owens, I believe, yes. So I, um, I'm glad that we were able to have this topic on the agenda as well because obviously it needed to be discussed in a, a public forum so that everybody is on the same page and at least has an accurate understanding about what's going on. Um, I'm in agreement with the regulation as it's written. I do believe that citizens should have input in our processes, and I believe that they do. Uh, Ms. Weems you know, pointed out that we have citizens that are grandparents and that are gonna have four-year-olds who are gonna enter our system and that they should have input, and I agree that they should, and I agree that they can, Certainly citizens who have grandchildren in our system, I would encourage them to talk to the children's parents and let them know what they feel like they should know about their concerns about a book. And if the parent agrees, that parent can make the steps take needed to restrict the book from that child. Parent who has a, a four-year-old who's gonna come into the system and they have concerns about a book, Excellent. As soon as you get here, you can make sure that you put the parameters in place for your child without overstepping the, the rights and availability to other people's children to access books in our libraries. Um, I think that we you mentioned all the other places where citizens have input in our district, like the calendars and the school schedules, and that we ask for that input. In, we take it, we listen to it, we consider it, and we make a decision. There's not a, a process in which a citizen can then say, well, I don't like that calendar, I'd like to challenge it up the ladder, that's not a, it's not a thing. And so I think that this, where we are, is reasonable. Uh, I don't know how many library media specialists are gonna have to come into the meeting and ask to be respected, just basic respect for their profession and not be name called and uh, called porn peddlers and every other kind of groomer before we can just respect our staff, even if we disagree. We're, we don't have to disagree to agree with everything. I think whether you feel that Dr. Spence was out of line for saying, for, for trying to protect the staff members, I think it was worth noting that we don't need to name call, the, the porn peddlers, the, the porn words, when we have the definitions, we know what is explicit material, we know what is pornography, there are definitions in code section, and I mean, that's, that's all there is to it. You, when you mentioned, Vicki, the book, um, you started off the sentence with, in my opinion, this is pornographic, and I think that part is very important, in my opinion, because there's a, a definition already in place by law, and so we all have the right to have opinions, but if we could just stop pushing the name calling for our staff, then we won't have to have the superintendent jumping in to try and protect and having the drama where we have to remove children out of the chambers. I'm okay with this regulation as it is, I'm open to discussion, I'm open to disagreement, but I would love it if we could just keep it at a basic level of professionalism. Mrs. Holtz. Uh, thank you, Mrs. Chairman. Um, well, I, I'm afraid you just said pretty much what I was gonna say. We're on opposite ends of the dias, but many times we think the same. Um, we, <laughs> There are four people that came before us tonight and they have no children in the school. And when they come before us and say, 
They want a book taken out of the library. They take away my right to have my family member read that book. I really do resent that. They have no right to do that. But if you as a parent want, did not want your child reading particular books, their name can be listed with the librarian. That's easy to do. We have databases and uh, your child, you don't want your child to read it? Okay, that's fine. Put their name on a list. I mean, we have a list for everything else, free lunch, uh, you know, different, uh, different subject matters and stuff like that. But um, I have sat here all evening being told that I'm a pornographer, that I'm a, uh, yeah, that I'm pushing pornography. I, I lost count. I started counting. I lost count. I was livid when, when I heard that. And I see it on social media that I'm doing that too. So I want to thank our superintendent, Dr. Spence, for at least sticking up for the board and sticking up for me personally, because I take that as an insult. And two of our people here tonight said we were breaking the law. And I'm to sit here and say and agree is silence agreement. I'm not silent. I'm not a, a a pornographer and the definition as you mentioned we just don't agree on that definition one of us is wrong and it isn't me and thank you dr. Spencer sticking up for me personally and I hope other members of the board who feel the way I do will say it so also oh and by the way these people here tonight they didn't just decide this on their own this was a consorted effort by one of our board members in my opinion she brought them here tonight well, to support Mrs. herself. Let's we can't I'm accuse finished. we I'm can't finished. accuse without pr proof of anything. All right, so we have Mrs. Hughes and then Mrs. Weems. Yeah, the name calling's been working both ways. We've heard Nazis, book burners, banning, and none of that's actually true. Um, banning means you expect nothing to be available anywhere. Um, and I'll use the same example. We don't serve alcohol in our schools, but we're not pushing for prohibition. Some things simply are not appropriate at certain times. And we're hearing a lot about children's choice. But first of all, children and adults are not peers. Adults do get to make choices for children. Children are also not allowed to buy firearms, enlist in the military, sign contracts. There are a lot of things children are not allowed to do, and I don't see people up in arms about that. We've heard a lot of people talk about you should only be making choices for your children, not other people's children. And Ms. Holtz pointed out, you know, that somebody would be taking rights away from her family, but you don't have any children in the schools anymore either. Yes, By that stand, yeah. I'm, it's my turn. Your children are grown. Don't point and don't mention me. Please. So by that standard, only one board member would be allowed to speak on this because only one board member actually has children in Virginia Beach public schools right now, and I don't think that's the public elected the other 10 of us to just sit on our hands and not speak. One of the reasons that I proposed a resolution that nobody wanted to discuss that will hopefully be on next meeting for information was just for that, so that parents would be deciding for their own children. We've heard parents, teachers, librarians, board members, and principals talk about how you need to make decisions for your children and not other people's children. Yet when I suggested ways to do that, like a parents getting a ping when their child checks out a book, we heard a million reasons why we can't do it. And the people that seem to think everybody should be choosing for their own children and not other people's children seem to have a problem with that. So it seems kind of disingenuous that any way that would allow someone who disagrees with you to choose only for their children, you're finding a way we can't do it. The truth is you want to make everybody wear orange if you like orange. You don't want everybody to have a choice. Oh, excuse me. So, uh, no. Okay. Excuse me, it's not. Miss Anderson, Mrs. I have not Hughes is speaking right now. You wait your Mrs. turn. Mrs. Anderson, stop. Stop. It needs to stop. Wrap this up with these last three speakers, Mrs. Weems, Mrs. Franklin, Mrs. Riggs. Thank you. Um, oh, I think we need to all take a deep breath and relax. Um, we, could, we can do this in a civil matter. I, I know we can. Um, 
I want to just reemphasize because I got several texts, Chair Rye, that my comments could not be heard, um, I guess, to those that were zooming in. But I do not think it's wise to limit this part to citizens because we get input from others for a, just a multitude of things that we ask citizens for. We know that the school system just doesn't benefit our school children. Our school system actually benefits the city, okay, for being a great place to live because of our strong school system. Um, many of our citizens are grandparents. Many of our citizens who may want to challenge a book just had kids go through our system or, or, or have three and four year olds that are going to enter our system, hopefully. So I don't think limiting it is, is a wise thing to do. And I think that, you know, I keep hearing a, just, you know, a citizen, just a random citizen out there cannot tell, school cannot limit it for other school kids. Well, you're assuming that just because a citizen challenges something that it's all, it's automatically, okay, the citizen challenge, so automatically we're not gonna have that book. No, this challenge is just for it to go through the uh, another level of the process. And so, you know, stop that assumption because that's just, you know, that's just not accurate. And, and the idea of, well, they can get it anyway, they can get it on their cell phones. Well, yeah, there's a lot of things that our students can get anyway, but we don't need to have it in, you know, in front of them all the time. Yeah, they can drink soda all the time, but we're not going to serve soda at lunch and breakfast when we serve our children. So, uh, you know, I, I really don't like that comparison either. But, um, but I just think that, that just including all citizens is not going to hurt the process any, and it doesn't mean it's automatically a citizen is stopping, you know, my rights as a parent. It doesn't mean that at all. They're just involved in the process because, again, half of their money, over half their taxes or to fund our libraries in our schools, our teachers, our buildings. So they have they have skin in the game. They really do. Um, so that's all my comments. And let's and and Miss Hughes, it wasn't that some of us weren't didn't want to discuss it. It's just at a timely matter. The agenda was full, and I look forward to the discussion at, a, at another time in a couple of weeks. Thank you. Okay, go ahead, Mrs. Franklin. Thank you. Well, I, I actually agree wholeheartedly with with so much of what Mrs. Owen said as well. And I just want to um, also reiterate that, well, you know, Ms. Rye, you actually, you know, had a lovely poem that you provided yesterday at the teacher orientation. And it really talked about the partnership between parents and the school system and the school division and how we all collaborate to help these wonderful kids get a great education, but also, you know, help build the skills necessary to be great model citizens when they leave here. And I would like to please, please remind everybody that we are not adversaries. We are partners. The parents are partners with the division. The division is partnering with the parents. You know, many people that are in the schools spend, you know, eight hours a day with your children. Don't treat them, please, like an enemy, that we are all partners. And I ask everybody to remember that we have to, like Ms. Owen said, we have to look at this from a lens of respect. Because I'm going to tell you, just any psychologist would say that if you attack somebody, if you call them names, if you immediately put them on the defensive, which is not going to help the children. And that is exactly what we should all be here for. We are students first. We, we are, you know, we have that in our model. We have that in so many things that we talk about. And if you are attacking each other, it is not helpful for making sure that we are accomplishing our goal. So I agree. I think that we should start trying to come from a lens of respect from both sides, because I do hear it from both sides. And I would ask that we just continue to have a very robust discussion in a respectful manner, because ultimately this is about the kids and we are, should be, and, and I hope that we are looking at this as a partnership and not in, in terms of an adversarial uh, situation here. And I just, I just hope that we can start viewing this and looking at this in a more respectful manner as well. Thank you. And Mrs. Riggs. I just, just for the record, I wanted to uh, thank Mrs. Owens. Thank you, because you said exactly what I was feeling, as well as um, Mrs. Franklin. Thank you. 
um, it really is hard to sit up here and listen to um, each other call each other out and to hear um, our school board members and citizens and people put our administration and our teachers and our librarians and our superintendent down the way they are. The disrespect has gone so far and too far. I consider myself a mature, intelligent adult that ran for this board because I care about the kids in this city. And I think everyone did. Every one of you and every one of you administrators, librarians, teachers, all care about our kids and citizens, the people that are challenging. I get it. But there is a respectful way to talk to people and to listen to people. And we've all forgot, many of us have forgotten how to do that. And that's, that's so wrong. And to watch a father have to take two children out because of the discussion we've had in here really makes me sick and it breaks my heart and it, and it takes the respect away from all of us every one of us people that some of us that have sat up here and listened and don't say much and then people that do and i understand dr spence speaking out and i thank you for um, protecting your staff and taking up for your staff and your administrators and I just, um, I, I think it's time for us to, to, like Mrs. Owen said, let's stop calling people names. We can have robust discussions, but we need to say things without pointing fingers and calling names, and especially some of the things that are being said. Those are insults that are just far beyond what any any educator would ever want to be called. And I don't know why porn peddlers and those kind of words are being used, except for to create this type of atmosphere. Is this what we want to show our children? I, I just, it's so embarrassing to go out in the public and hear people ask us, what are you guys doing up there? Well, personally, I ran to support our children, our school system, our administrators, our city that I was born and raised in and educated in and truly believe in and love. And I don't want to see it going this way. Please, I don't care what's coming up, what happens in November, let's please have respect for each other and ourselves. Thank you. So as to where things stand now, I think the administration's made it clear that with, if there was a majority opinion to revisit this regulation, they would. I'm just saying that unofficially, I, I have not heard majority opinion with that request. I heard the PRC chair uh, comment, and correct me if I'm wrong, that given these state guidelines that are yet to be finalized, that you are willing to wait for that. At that point, when we have finalized state guidelines on this, see if that's a good point for the PRC to take another look at these regulations, because the, the look could happen now, and then it would have to be changed Which is what I've again. made, made it, very clear. I, mm -hmm. was I, so I made I that very clear, that. I hope, to Mrs. Manning and uh, with the PRC, our committee, and Mrs. Uh, Linetti, because she keeps saying, wait, there's more. You know, we have not finished. The, the state hasn't finished. And I think it would be um, presumptuous of, of us to spend that kind of time and effort. Let's get all of the guidelines. But I have no problem looking over them and reviewing them again. And I did get your um, suggestions. We can discuss that as well. Um, 
So I, I have no problem. I'm sure the rest of the PRC committee Confirm would be fine with that. You would be reviewing policy 661 and policy 712. We'll, well, we'll the follow, associated we'll follow what the regulations. The regulation is drafted this. for the secretary explicit. That's a regular. We drafted it as a regulation. I was referring to the regulation that, that those would be revisited at the time that the explicit that the state, state. finalizes yes. its guidelines. That That's timing what I seems to make, and maybe we can ask for monthly updates during admin matters from Mrs. Linetti on where we do stand, or, or from the administration on where we stand with the state progress on that. Um, I, I will tell you, I think uh, Dr. Rogers has provided you a pretty good explanation of how they think they will comply with it. What we will be doing is tweaking any changes the last time we drafted it. The, the draft policy, uh, draft regulation was done about two months ago. We're just waiting. Um, I, and I have no problem looking over it again. I, I you know, there's um, tonight showed a very ugly side of um, citizens and, and people speaking both both ways. Um, If, if that is going to result in like nights like tonight, where our families need to turn their TVs off and not watch it or take their children out, I think we need to think about it. I have no problem with citizens weighing in. Their tax money does go okay. to our schools. Okay. And our school system brings the people here. But okay. we need to talk about it and discuss it in that policy review some more. So we'll wait and, and just see what the state, what tweaking we need to do. I think you guys have done a fantastic job. Thank you, Dr. Rogers and uh, Ms. Schubert and, and your, your uh, team and department. Okay. You've done a fantastic job. You've worked very hard, and it's very obvious. You've spent a lot of time and thought. Thank you. OK, we need to proceed with the rest of our agenda now. The consent agenda. No, ma'am, you have information for policy. I mean, the, <laughs> ah, speaking of, welcome, Mrs. Linetti. Yes, nine policy, a bylaw and eight policies. So floor is, the floor Chair, is yours. Vice Chair, School Board members, and Dr. Spence. I'm Cammie Linetti, School Board Attorney. And on behalf of the Policy Review Committee, I will be presenting the recommended bylaw and policy changes from the August 10th 2022 meeting. I will state for you they are nowhere near as exciting as what you were just discussing, and most of them will go fairly quickly. The first one is bylaw 1 9. Which, one, I'm sorry. Is, that's the bylaw that I wanted it, to us to look at and bring back to the. No. Okay. Not, I, no, no, I, no, I no, just want to make sure. 1 9 is actually relatively simple. Um, 1 9. As I mentioned before, we were required to go through the bylaws um, at a certain time period, and one of these got left behind, should have been um, sent back to you last year, and we caught it and brought it back. One nine deals with qualifications of school board members. There were significant changes in the General Assembly in 2020 and 2021 involving what, qualify, what a qualified bona, bona fide resident is in a election district or ward, depending on what your city, county, or town is mm -hmm. using. We needed to update that. So what we did with 1-9 is we subdivided it up. We added a new Section A, Qualified Voter and Bonafide Resident. This came out of um, changes to the General Assembly, which requires that you be um, elected, uh, appointed or elected as a qualified voter and a bona fide resident of the district from which such person is selected if appointment election is by district or, or the school division appointment is at large and such person ceases to be a resident of such district or school division, such person's position on the school board shall be deemed vacant. That is a new change and a clarification of the law. We then create a subsection B, resident of district award if at large in the city, and then we go on and explain how um, if the city of Virginia Beach imposes district-based award-based residency requirements for members of the school board and city council, and we note in here that if the court requires such districts, the member elected from each ward or district shall be elected by the qualified voters of the district of that district award and not by the locality at large. If an individual is appointed to be a school board member, such a person must be a resident qualified voter of the district award if appointed to a district award. If such an individual is appointed to be a school board member at, to an at-large position, such a person must be a resident of the city and a qualified voter. You will also notice in the first paragraph we've added a subnote to that, so it's up to the end of the of a sentence that said, um, qualification for election 
or appointment to and continuing service on the school board of the city of Virginia Beach are established in the legal reference to this bylaw or is required by a court of competent jurisdiction. As I've kept you updated, and I'm sure if you've monitored in the news, we are, our election system is currently under another challenge and we're not quite sure where we're going to be. So we put that caveat in there, which will give you some time to just depending on whatever is eventually done by the courts or by the general assembly. Then we put it moved subsection C oath of office, created subsection C and D compliance with the conflict of interest act. And we updated your legal references to that. So most of this, except for the first two paragraphs was in there before we divided to make a little bit clearer. All this is required by the new statutory uh, requirements that have been in the last two years in the general assembly. So we're just bringing this bylaw into compliance. That's a lot of information, but are there are any questions on this bylaw? Hearing no questions, I will move on to policy 215. 215, it has to do with communication with staff. 215 falls under the section of the policies having to do with administration. There are no recommended changes to this. This was last looked at in 2013, and we just renewed it, reviewed it in requirement with the um, SOAs for the five-year look back. So there are no recommended changes to policy 215. Are there any questions on 215? Hearing no questions on 215, we'll move on to policy 48. 48 falls under your personnel section. This is the employee input process. We do recognize that you're looking at some changes in there. However, at this time, we're not recommending any changes to this policy. So this has just been reviewed, but no recommended changes. Any questions on policy 48? Moving on then to policy 629, which is drug education. If you take a look at the um, reference on this, this policy was last looked at in, I think, 2006. Um, there, there have been some changes in the law and the regulations having to do this. So we updated on policy 629. We added a section right under your title which explained about the illegal and appropriate use of substances constitute a hazard to the development of students. Elementary and secondary schools shall include in the health education program instruction in drug and drug abuse. The difference before it simply said drug education is now drug and drug abuse education. We've added a significant um, additional language into subsection A about the program instruction. We took this out of the state regulations to make sure it was consistent that you knew what you were, what the school division was required to do. After that, you're only going to see a couple of Scrivener's changes and updated to the legal references. So we're just bringing this into compliance with changes in the regulation from the Virginia Department of Education. Are there any questions about policy 629? Here, no further questions on policy 621. We're going to look at policy 640. 640 falls under instruction. This has to do with science. There are only scrivener's changes. We took out the subsection A as there were no other subsections in here. We removed the editor's notes and we added references to the Virginia standards of Virginia Department of Education standards of learning having to do with science and Virginia Department of Education standards of learning having to do with science. It came out in 17 and 18 and computer science. And those are the only recommended recommended changes under for policy 640. Are there any questions on policy 640? Hearing no questions on policy 640, I will move to policy 654. We did make some significant changes in policy 654. And again, 654 has not been looked at since 2006. However, you'll re remember that we did some significant updating to the regulations having to do with homework at the elementary, middle, high school level and grading guidelines a number of years ago. So we went back and looked at policy 654. It was necessary to update this to make this consistent with those guidelines. So you will see a lot of strikeouts and a whole new addition to the initial paragraph on homework. We added a subsection A that talked about definition of goals, again, pulled out of your guidelines. B, with partnership with families, we modified that, took out a lot of the language that was no longer relevant. We added subsection C with homework, um, just updating some of the areas that are in there. And we referenced the homework guidelines, again, um, noting that subsection D has states that there is no disciplinary nature in homework. And then we updated the legal references to, rec to reflect the new regulations that have to do with the homework, the elementary, the middle, and the high school level. Also noting to your grading guidelines and the best practice. BPCPS guidelines for best practice in evaluation, grading, reporting, student academic progress in secondary schools, which was published in September of 2021. We think this is more consistent as drafted with your current regulations. A lot of information, but again, you've looked at those regulation grading guidelines before. Are there any questions on policy 654? The uh, last sentence under C on homework assignments that was added where it says the superintendent or designee will prepare guidelines for homework that may be differentiated uh, by grade levels. 
is that something that is going to be in a regulation or just kind of in general, uh, those differentiations being like time frames of how long homework should take at different grade levels and that kind of thing? The legal references cite the regulations. You'll see there's an elementary, middle, high school ones and guidelines. So there, you can look there for more details. Got it. Thank you. Bidding for the questions on 654. Moving on to 673. Again, 673 is testing and assessment under your instruction section of your policies and regulations. It was last looked at in 1993, so it did need to be updated. Uh, we made some changes to it, not particularly significant changes to it, but again, you will notice in 1993, we did not have the standards of learning into our, our policy, so we added reference to that as a final sentence, and also recognizing that the growth assessments and other required testing assessments are now part of our testing assessment program, and we updated the legal references to this section. Are there any questions on policy 673? Any other questions on 673, we'll look at policy 681, which is adult education. We did not make any significant changes in this other than to update the legal references and make sure they were compliant and then noting this is, will then comply with the five-year review. Are there any questions on 681 having to do with adult education? On to our final recommended policy for the night would be 682, adult high school diploma program. We only made small um, scrivener changes to the body. This changing one of the words and um, adding another word that was missing. The other changes were significant updating to the legal references as there are new programs in place for adult education and guidelines that were, since were out of date. We needed to update all of those to make sure they were currently compliant with the laws that are in effect in 2022. Other than that, there will be no recommended changes. Are there any questions as to the recommendations for the policy review committee from the August meeting? I just I'm curious just uh, appendix B was discussed I don't see that on here I um, asked that was the appendix that I asked to bring back to the policy review um, correct we had a two and so I vote. think that's why you guys took it off the agenda but I because uh, dr. Robertson wasn't there at our last policy review there were a couple of questions so I, I think that's why they left it off I, so but because I, I asked it was the a, chair a majority to bring vote it back. coming out of PRC to bring it in but in the meantime there came back from the administration that they wanted to take a look right. at day one and they they contacted me so I asked for it to be brought back to policy review so that's why. I don't have a problem with it being brought back but once a committee takes a vote to move something forward it should have been on here and discussed because we have procedures we're supposed to follow and I mean that was actually the discussion that Ms. Riggs and I had is it should be on here because that's what we voted to do. And so it should have been discussed at this meeting to bring it back. We, we just seem to be playing fast and loose with a lot of policies. And that's leading to a lot of issues like this hour debate we just had. I think that um, they took that request for me and probably thought because I didn't respond to the last email from you, but that's I think that's what happened. But um, I think we are pretty much going by our policies and, and what we should be doing with our policy review. So um, I asked for that to happen because our uh, administrators, uh, Dr. Robertson wasn't there and Dr. Uh, Spence had some questions about it. So I thought we would bring that back, so. Okay, the consent agenda. I'll read the following consent agenda items. Uh, Two resolutions to be read soon, uh, shortly, <laughs> Suicide Prevention Week and National Hispanic Heritage Month. Uh, and the, policy, the following policy review recommendations, there are six policies, policy 3-22 tuition fees, policy 5-14 school attendance zones, policy 646 extracurricular activities, Policy 648, Middle School Activities Program. Policy 651, Scheduling for Instruction. And policy 653, Grouping Instruction. And then uh, C is Religious Exemption. So motion to approve. Mrs. Riggs, a second. Mrs. Uh, Hughes. 
And we Ms. Rye? Yes. Yes, Is Mrs. There, Williams? I, I'm sorry that I'm late at this, but could I request that the resolutions be voted on separately? Divide the consent agenda into the two resolutions and then the other. Uh, would you just be moving them to action instead? Yeah. Was, are you, yes. We adopted the agenda already. Is this okay. Are you asking to vote individually on one resolution or each resolution? I want to support the resolutions that are going to be read. I'm not going to support the other. But if it's too late, that's fine. That's my fault, I guess. Yes. My question to you is we have the agenda adopted, Mrs. Linetti, so. You took a motion on the consent agenda, so the question is, is she making another motion? Do we need a second to split this out? And well, I, I'm, ask, I'm rewinding back to the adoption of the agenda. Is, is that now that the agenda has been adopted, can her proposal be considered or not? It can be considered. She would need a second. She'd have to motion. She'd be asking to move. Um, it appears to be two of these to an action item, so it's. Well, I don't think you meant you asked for an action item. You just asked for two separate votes, right, Mrs. Yes. Williams? Yes, I make the motion to have two separate votes on the consent agenda. One will be the two resolutions, and the other will be the remaining. So, so wait. So I'm just asking Mrs. Linetti, is that allowed is that allowed given that we've adopted the agenda? You just took a vote on the consent agenda. So yes. No, we haven't a taken a vote on you the took consent a vote agenda to, yet. I haven't asked for a motion yet. I only read the consent agenda. But I'm asking we adopted the agenda earlier. For the so can it now be split out? Yes. Okay. She can make a motion to split. And All I'm right. not clear. I guess the question is, are you asking to consent or are you asking to move the resolutions down to action? She didn't say action. Two Which, separate consent. Whichever is easier. Could two separate I'm consent support, votes. I'm supporting the resolution. I don't want to vote, vote no when someone say I, I didn't support the resolution on the suicide or the um, other resolution. So I'm supporting the two resolutions. So whichever is easier for the chair to do is fine with me. I'll so think. a second. Second. Okay, so we will vote separately. So we'll start with the two resolutions and we'll read those. Mrs. Melnick. Don't you have you to vote to, on her motion? Ms. You need to vote. The motion is, okay. and if I'm correct, Mrs. Williams, see if yes. I'm correct. Your motion is to split the consent agenda and you would vote on items A1 and A2 first on consent, and then there would be a second consent vote to take items B1 through 6 and C as the second correct vote. okay that correct. was mrs manning i believe you were the, the second to that is that correct yes so the motion on the floor is to split this up a consent a one and two is one vote and consent b and c are the second vote okay. any can we go ahead and vote okay please show a raised hand if you approve we have to be split this is to be to have a split yeah. vote yes a split vote Mrs. Williams, how do you vote? Yes. Okay, all opposed. Ms. Franklin, how do you vote? Yes. Thank you. All opposed, please show a raised hand. Okay, Madam Chair, we have 10 ayes and one nay, so the motion did pass to separate the resolution A1 and A2 into a vote and then the policies into another vote. So I'll now call for a motion to approve the two resolutions and then they'll be read. So motion for approval, Mrs. Sure. Ms. Owens and a second, Mrs. Manning. Mrs. Uh, Melnick, would you please re read the, the first oh, well, resolution? Well, tonight we have oh, Suicide oh. Prevention Week, um, Ms. Ms. Riggs. The resolution for Suicide Prevention Week, September 19th through 23rd, 2022. I would like to say I am dedicating this to the many families that are living through uh, the results of this, including my own, my um, stepson, Jake Wakefield. Whereas suicide continues to be a top 10 leading cause of death for multiple age groups in the United States and the third leading cause of death among individuals, between the ages of 15 to 24, and whereas suicide is now the second leading cause of death in the state of Virginia among individuals between the ages of 15 to 24, and whereas suicide strikes without regard 
to locality, social economic status, ethnicity, religious preference, or age. And whereas in the United States, one person completes suicide every 11 minutes, and on average, there are more than 20 suicide attempts for each suicide completion. And whereas education and community involvement are known to be the most crucial factors in preventing suicide. And whereas the school board of the city of Virginia Beach is focused on ways to educate students, parents, and employees about suicide and prevention of suicide. And whereas Virginia Beach City Public Schools, through sustained and dedicated efforts, has implemented programs for all employees and students that recognize a deep commitment at all levels to raise awareness of suicide and its prevention. Now, therefore, be it resolved that the School Board of the City of Virginia Beach designates the week of September 19th through 23rd, 2022, as Suicide Prevention and Awareness Week in Virginia Beach City Public Schools, and be it further resolved that strategies and activities to address suicide prevention and suicidal behaviors be ongoing in Virginia Beach City Public Schools, and be it further resolved that a copy of this resolution be spread across the official minutes of this board, adopted by the School Board of the City of Virginia Beach this 23rd day of August, 2022. Thank you, Mrs. Riggs. And B is National Hispanic Heritage Month. Okay, I'll be reading for National Hispanic Hispanic Heritage Month, which is September 15th through October 15th, 2022. Whereas one of our nation's greatest strengths is its vast diversity, which enables Americans to see the world from many viewpoints. And whereas National Hispanic Heritage Month honors the cultures and contributions of both Latino and Hispanic Americans, and whereas Latino and Hispanic Americans embrace a deep commitment to family, community, and education, and a perseverance to succeed and contribute to the shaping of the country and our city of Virginia Beach. And whereas the 2022 Hispanic Heritage Month observance theme, Unidos, Inclusivity for Stronger Nation, invites us to reflect on the contributions Latino and Hispanic Americans have made in the past and will continue to make in the future. And whereas the school board of the city of Virginia Beach recognizes the importance of culturally responsive education and embraces multicultural diversity within our school division. Now therefore be it resolved that the school board of the city of Virginia Beach officially recognizes September 15th through October 15th as National Hispanic Heritage Month, and be it further resolved that the School Board of the City of Virginia Beach encourages all citizens to support and participate in the various school activities available during National Hispanic Heritage Month, and be it further resolved that a copy of this resolution be spread across the official minutes of this board adopted by the School Board of the City of Virginia Beach this 23rd day of August 2022. Thank you, Ms. Owens. So now I call for a motion to approve these two resolutions as presented. I mean, I'm sorry, I call for the vote to approve the two resolutions as presented. All in favor, show a raised hand. Ms. Weems, how do you vote? Ms. Weems, how do you vote? Ms. Franklin, yes. thank you. Ms. Franklin, how do you vote? Yes. Thank you, Madam Chair. We have a unanimous vote for the resolutions. Okay, and then we have the policy review recommendations that were previously read and the religious exemptions. So a motion to approve, Mrs. Felton and a second, Mrs. Melnick. All in favor, show a raised hand, please. Ms. Weems, how do you vote? No. Ms. Franklin, how do you vote? Yes. Okay, Madam Chair, we have uh, 10 ayes and one nay, so the motion did pass. Thank you, Madam Clerk. Okay, action portion of the agenda, beginning with personnel report and administrative appointments. 
Uh, so motion to approve the August 23rd personnel report and administrative appointments. Mrs. Anderson and a second Mrs. Melnick, please show your approval with a raised hand. Ms. Franklin, how do you vote? Yes. Thank you. Ms. Weems, how do you vote? Yes. Thank you, Madam Chair. We have a unanimous vote. Thank you. So, Mr. Dr. Spence, would you please proceed to announce our administrative appointments and these lovely ladies and gentlemen who've been waiting patiently? I will. Thank you, Madam Chairwoman. And if I could start with uh, Alexis uh, Downham. If you could please stand. Thank you. Um, so, Ms. Downham has served as a teacher in New Jersey and in California. With distinction, she has served here at Bayside Middle School as a teacher, also at Salem Middle School. Most recently, she has been serving as an administrative assistant at Bayside Middle School. And this evening, we are pleased that you've accepted our recommendation for her to serve as the next assistant principal at Bayside Middle School. Congratulations. Mm -hmm. And I understand you have some guests with you. <laughs> Would you like to introduce them? My girls, my grandkids, and my husband. Please have them stand for a moment. Come on. <laughs> hey. I, I'm guessing twins here, right? Yes. <laughs> yes. Um, if I could also ask Simone Booth Esquire to please stand. Mrs. Booth has served with distinction as a disability determination analyst for the Commonwealth of Virginia. She's been a law clerk in New Jersey at the Superior Court of New Jersey. She has been an attorney at uh, law in Suffolk and an attorney in, for the Commonwealth of Virginia in the Indigent Defense Commission. And she has most recently been serving as an attorney for the city of Portsmouth. And we are pleased this evening that you have accepted our recommendation for her to serve as the next associate school board attorney in the Department of Legal Services. Congratulations to you. Yeah. And I understand you have guests. I do. I have my mom, my big brother. Please, please have them rise. <laughs> Thank you all for being here. We're certainly glad that you're uh, you're coming over from Portsmouth. Yeah. Um, and finally, if I could ask uh, Kelly Singer to please stand up, so you all will recognize Ms. Singer. She has served as a teacher in uh, North Carolina, in Georgia, um, also as a teacher at Lansdowne High School, where she worked with my own child, which was very nice, and um, has most recently been serving as a professional learning specialist in the Office of Professional Growth and Innovation. And this evening, we are pleased that you have accepted our recommendation for her to serve as the next coordinator of professional learning in the Office of Professional Growth and Innovation. Congratulations. <laughs> you have guests as well? <laughs> and it's also nice to see our principal at Bayside Middle School with us tonight yeah. as well. Um, and uh, that that is it, uh, Madam Chair. And I, two, are you two young ladies? Are you students with us? No. You're not. Where do you go to school? Chesapeake. That's okay. <laughs> That's okay. <laughs> I just want you to know that um, I endeavor to model conduct for our students and staff at all times. I failed you tonight, and I apologize to both of you. Okay. Policy review recommendations that are down as action items for this evening. Uh, and can I get two slides up here? Let me just do that. Okay. So let me see where she was. Um, policy review record. Correct. Okay. Policy 3-65, security of buildings and grounds, cell phones, and other portable telecommunication devices. So I call for a motion to approve policy 3-65, security of buildings and grounds, cell phones, and other portable telecommunication devices. All right, motion made by Mrs. Manning, second by Mrs. Holtz. Any discussion? Okay, Mrs. Hughes. Um, just one thing, kind of a question. We actually had a nurse, a school nurse, send us an email and she had commented, and this is something we hadn't discussed, but maybe it's included, that um, an area where students are having 
any sort of medical help is a private area and will this extend to in the clinics will students not be allowed to bring things like this she said students have actually been in there and taken pictures of other students while they were in there getting medication and stuff like that she doesn't want them in the clinics correct if you look at the regulation it does refer to the nurse's office okay um, I can pinpoint that exactly for you um, I just instructional setting number two discussion. under a Oh, I'm sorry. Medical or health-related okay. activities. Good. Okay. Thank you. That's all I had. You're okay. Welcome. Mrs. Manning? Yeah, a few questions that I got from some constituents. Um, it's not spelled out in here about these smart watches. I know it says accessories. Does that mean watches? It does. Um, okay. But as we've shared, the, the easiest things we can really get our hands on are the earbuds and the cell phones. Mm -hmm. We don't feel like we want to put teachers in position to, to begin like scanning every kid that comes into what they're wearing or so forth. If they notice a student using their smartwatch, then obviously that would be an accessory and would be a violation. Okay, so they just shouldn't be using it. So my recommendation it to parents would be if your child has a smartwatch that that's secured and put away as well. Okay, um, and then uh, some parents, and I understand their concern, you know, they find out in the morning when they get to school that they're going to have to stay after school for tutoring or an activity. Um, is there a time during the day when they're going to be allowed to, like, text their parents and let them know? So when you look at the regulation, we really wanted to be mindful of three different levels of schooling that go on. And, and so high school students, for example, we're mindful that they're going to be able to access them in the hallways and during lunchtime. Okay. So for a community that's listening, high school students are coming and going all day long. After first block, seniors that are excused are coming in. After second block, they're going to the Career and Technical Education Center. Others are coming back. And then you have fourth block where they're excused, seniors leaving. So it's a lot different than the middle school and the elementary school in that level of movement. So from the high school end, we're expecting them to be able to access that for the purpose that you're saying mm -hmm. in the hallways and in the, in the cafeteria during lunch. Middle schools is a different dynamic. They don't have as much movement. That restriction will be greater in terms of they're expected to have it in their backpack and put away. They don't have as much movement in and out as, it, as well. So we'd recommend in those cases that parents are contacting the school. And typically schools will send out if there's any cha excuse me, any changes to athletic events. Okay, or if the, if the child gets permission from the teacher or... A, um, yeah, I think they can. They, there's some reasonable things. They got, not permission from the teacher during instructional time. Right. That, that, right. that opens up a Pandora's box right. that basically puts us where we are. I think the opportunity would be, can I go to the, can I go to the office and... and, and or to my school counselor and, and notify my parent. I think there's methods that they can do that. Okay. And then just one other thing. Um, I heard for some, from some bus drivers that they feel the phones have been very disruptive on the bus. Some other bus drivers say, you know, it keeps kids busy. You know, they're listening quietly to their music and they didn't want to um, stop that. But some bus drivers have said that kids are playing music loud um, or taking pictures or videos. Um, and it's, it's very disturbing. I, I assume that that's already not permitted on For the buses. Any type of disruption that puts the bus driver in an area of safety concern, she okay. certainly, or the bus driver would certainly want to alert administration to that concern. Um, so, they are te that's not an instructional setting. That is not instructional right. time. But obviously they are in control of kind of the behavior on that bus and the administrations that support them. So this and, doesn't uh, necessarily govern what happens on the bus. And if a bus driver has a concern, they should contact um, their superior at in correct because what you're explaining could be other violations right okay such as inappropriate videos or things such as that going on or, or failure to comply okay. so if a bus driver says you i need you to turn that music off and the student decides not to that's not a cell phone that's a failure to comply okay and if they repeatedly do that that's another disruption to the educational environment so when you look at the disciplinary guidelines as you know miss manning but i'm speaking more for anybody that's listening that there's several different disciplinary things that could be packaged in with the cell phone use as well and, and those are the ones that we see in the very disturbing cases in many instances okay thank you you're welcome miss owens um miss franklin has her hand raised okay and i guess uh, my question is this may go without saying perhaps um is there an understanding within the the policy that if there is a uh, medical or otherwise indicated reason documented in an IEP or a 504 that um, 
whatever accommodations will continue to be allowed if they are using their cell phone to check their uh, glucose in their arm or whatever uh, throughout the day that that's something that can be written in and accommodations made. Absolutely. And, and, and as you probably know, in many of those instances, a health plan is put together in right. conjunction with the school nurse. Okay. which then allows that to go on and, and uh, of course we want to respect the confidentiality of the student that has to go through those processes but we typically find that they are pretty good at self-regulating other behaviors as well but that absolutely the IEP would take accommodations would be ones we'd have to okay and so if a follow. student currently used has diabetes or some other diabetes I'm very familiar with and is using it but doesn't have uh, a 504 they would just need to make arrangements to have that written in they would do that was that, that would probably just be a health plan if they don't already okay. have a 504 and our health plans do fall under 504 um, we would be looking at other types of issues we have some devices where a parent can listen in the whole time that's what we worry about those type of devices where you're uh, might be recording somebody that we would have to look at more particularly on there what we don't want to see is my child would be happier to have her phone so she can talk to a friend all day long so we don't want that being written as accommodation we would like it to be taken to the appropriate body with that 504 a health plan or an IEP team to make that determination so thank you you're welcome okay. mrs. Anderson so my concern and I've heard from other parents about this I've gotten a couple phone calls um, and they were concerned that um, and I'm just going to say boys in general, but I, this could this could also be girls who don't carry a backpack or don't carry a purse and have their phone in their pocket. And, and basically, in the regulation down here, it, it says that they can't even have it in their clothing. So I I'm concerned about that because um, there are students who do not carry a backpack, do not have a purse. They put their if there's not. As far as I'm concerned, their phone is off and it's not being used. I don't see why, especially if, if an emergency happens, they, they may need, need to be able to pull that phone out of their pocket and utilize it in an emergency. Um, I, I just, I have a problem with um, people who might have to carry their phone in their pocket. And I don't want a student to be in trouble just because they have no other place to put it. In many of the schools, we've removed lockers now. Um, so they may not have a locker to be able to utilize. Um, you, leaving it in their car, for example, will not help them if there is an emergency in the school. So this is the, this is the problem that I, some parents have talked about with me. And they're, they're concerned that if a kid has, you know, like a jacket and the phone's in the pocket, as long as it's turned off, that's what they're saying to me. I want to know if that can be addressed. The language in the regulation says should not. You know, okay. so it does not say must not okay. or will not. Now, this is the dilemma, Miss Anderson. And the reason it says why may not. Students may not have a personal communications device on or in use. Well, it says on, but maybe maybe that means during instructional time. Where does it say down here? Instructional. Yeah, I'm trying to locate where it says should not in there. I know it's in here. Should not. Okay, you're right. It does say uh, such items should not be kept on the person or in the clothing of a student as doing so allows the student to access the device with ease. So should not doesn't mean must not. Right, but my advice, correct. But my advice if you are counseling a parent that is asking this question mm -hmm. is what we discussed about the challenge of proximity. Right. I know. So as I, I'll use a personal example during the board meeting, it went off in my pocket. I took a brief look. It was my dad wondering if the board meeting was on. <laughs> and I had to like resist not immediately texting him because that's my dad. Yeah, right. So I took it and I like tossed it over towards Natalie and said, I, I don't want to be caught doing the, if it's not on me, then I don't hear that piece. And it wouldn't have taken my attention away. Right. So when you're speaking with parents. But if they haven't parents, turned well, off, you know. Correct. But. Uh, again, I'm, we're talking about teenagers. Yeah, yeah. Uh, that, how it. often do they turn it off to begin yeah. with? So my advice to a parent who says they don't bring something with them is we do encourage that they should bring something with them that alleviates that proximity concern. In instances where that may be the case, I would, I would ask that they meet with their teacher. Their teacher can sometimes has a caddy or something else for them to place that device. Okay. But I th the other thing I'll touch on, because I'm sure it'll come up, is the emergency concern. 
a lot of parents are worried Correct. about that. And, and we have very good processes in place to handle school-based emergencies. And I won't go to, I've experienced it as a principal. And I will tell you within that school-based emergency, within 15 minutes, we had an alert now message out to our community of what was taking place in our school. We also were able to do that. I think we gave out three or four within an hour, in an hour and a half, of what was taking place to secure their student. What I also found was we had about 250 kids that were also on social media and putting out inaccurate information mm -hmm. right. that then our school was having to respond to from calls coming in. So I understand the need for a parent to say, I'm in desperate. I want to get in contact with my child to make sure they're safe. I get that as a parent. Mm -hmm. But we also need to understand the impact that puts on schools to respond. And the other example I will give of that is anytime we have a bomb threat to a school or something like that happens all the time, it shuts the entire school down because what happens is parents call the main office as they should and then they begin to come in and pick up their students. So we have processes in place to handle school-based emergencies okay. that I think we need to continue to remind our families that we, we handle these things appropriately in many instances. And we, I know we tend to look at our most tragic situations and say, look what happened here. Well, in many of those situations, they didn't have the protocols in place that we do with our what is it, Office of Safe Schools and Energy Management? Did I get that no, correct? Not energy. Right. Emergency. Five dollars into the jar. <laughs> Darn it. I tried my best. You, um. So I, I don't want it to be misconstrued. I am a proponent of no phones being used during instructional time. So I don't want anybody to, to misconstrue that. I, I'm happy with, with this new ruling that's coming out here with uh, this. But I also want to, for any parents that are watching, um, we need parent help with this. Uh, the more that parents speak to their student about, you know, adhering to these, this new regulation and this new policy, um, the better it will be. So, um, and, you know, parents, as I said, should never be texting their child during school hours. <laughs> And so if there's an emergency, there are ways they can contact the school. So in addition to, I'll also point out in the regulations, it does actually address this topic. It says during an emergency, school emer actual school emergency, students who access stored personal commute devices to make calls for assistance won't be penalized. So we recognize that there may be a time when a kid needs to grab that phone and call somebody. Get it, yeah. And it, it's contemplated in the regulation but it is a good reminder for our community, for Mr. Delaney, that oftentimes those situations become far more complicated when students are sharing information that's inaccurate, which happens. Right. You, you see this all across the country when these mm -hmm. things are happening. Yep. And, and the folks who are trying to respond to the emergency get bogged down in trying to deal with those issues. And in fact, uh, one of the things we've learned through some of these emergencies is that the self-service can get cut out because so many people are getting on their cell phones, they can overwhelm the system. Mm -hmm. And so there's, uh, you know, there's good reasons not to encourage students to be on their phones during those moments. So I have one more thing, and that, that was a parent ask, are the punishments for, for this going to be system-wide? Is it, is it a system-wide, uh, are we going to leave this up to principals? How are we going to deal with so students If you mean system-wide, it's clearly articulated in our disciplinary guidelines of what the levels that a student could be uh, disciplined based on the infraction. And that has not changed. And a cell phone violation can be anywhere from a level one to a level three. Okay. Level two is ISS, level three is uh, OSS up to five days, which I do not see that occurring for a strict cell phone violation. Okay. I think when you look at the level one, it then becomes difficult to say they're all going to give a warning on the first instance or they're all going to give a detention on the first instance or Saturday school, or even in level one, you can revoke privilege. So I, we have to, as we do with all of our disciplinary incidences, entrust our administration to do a good job of providing due process and then administering the discipline that best meets what the behavior uh, that went along with that. And I think we would all, you, know, you could see what that could look like. We could get into 100 scenarios as people sometimes like to do. And it's just not an easy way to solve it by saying, first offense, this is what's going to happen. Second offense, this is what's going to happen. Uh, because in each situation, there's a different reaction or a different story behind what occurred. Mm -hmm. that we need to give the ability to provide due process and investigate that scenario. Our recommendation is that we're looking at more of a warning component in a first area, and then you're moving into that detention area. 
we certainly want to be mindful of in any discipline if, if the, to remove kids from the classroom for a long period of time for something that we need to coach them up on. And the other thing I would say around that, I'm using coaching up like I'm still coaching, but there's other components of a three-pronged approach that we have with SPAR. We are required to not only give the discipline but provide instructional support and, and also behavioral support. It's required by state law now. So that means we have to call home, but it also can mean we need to have a conference. This, this, your child's having a hard time. Yeah. putting their phone away and we need to see how we can help support them and how as a parent and a school-based staff we can work with each other on recognizing that need to help them. So, And I just feel like we need to make sure that our teachers realize that, that our administrators are going to support them in all endeavors of this. Um, I don't want to put any more pressure on the teachers to have to do any more about you know deciding when or I mean basically they look at these guidelines if they follow these guidelines this is the way it's supposed to be we're not trying to add any any discipline problems to the teachers plates but you know we we need to make sure that administration is going to back them no matter what on, on these you know, what I would share warnings. with you with that Miss Anderson if I may is when when you hear that from teachers is asking them have they notified administration mm -hmm. in many cases they have not and I, as a former principal I can remember those days of somebody teacher saying well I was another teacher told me not to refer kids and I said well who gave you that message how, how am I going to inter engage if I don't know based on you submitting something so it's always right. important that they're submitting that and working with their administration on that and then the support will follow okay great thank great you for my students. thank you Okay. Yeah, we raise the expectations for our kids. They typically rise to them. That's been my experience. So Mrs. Franklin, go ahead. Thank you. And I just wanted to see if, if um, Mr. Laney could actually ex just expound on that just the way he did during the email that he replied to um, that I sent to him. And just um, maybe it'll be a little bit more clear in terms of those different um, levels of offenses. And I, I just don't want to have any assumptions out there. So you had mentioned a level one, for example, might be just a warning. Um, but then if you couple it with an, you know, with um, uh, defiance or you know anything maybe going above that, then you know that might raise it to detention or you know level two or whatever. So I think that that would be very clear if we could just be very clear with the parents um, and and the students out there essentially coupling you know um uh, defiance or an attitude or you know anything else that comes along with that um might increase that level and, and and i know that seems kind of obvious but i just think it needs to be clear to everyone exactly what is going to uh cause it go to go from a level one to a level two to a level three or whatever uh, one thing I'll say, Ms. Franklin, is is at the beginning of the year, we send out documentation through the school of certain, of certain documents that families are re expected to review, and one of those is the Code of Student Conduct. And so I can discuss some of the levels here, but where they can really garner a lot of information is in that Code of Student Conduct, and I'm hoping through some of these conversations they're really going to dive into that Code of Student Conduct because there's other supports in there that talk about peer tutoring, talk about mental health supports. It's a great document for parents to really read and see what the school division has to offer. But the Agreed. example the example I'll give you is a cell phone is called a behavior related to school operations. And that can again be anywhere from a one to a three. A student then fails to comply, could go next to the next level, which is a one to a three, but a, a, the administrator may say, we're gonna go ahead and put you in an administrative detention on Wednesdays. If they continue to do this, they could then be hit with what is called, I'm using the word hit, could be you know, given interfering with um, school operations, which is just repeated failures to comply. You're just decided you're not going to comply to any of these things, and that immediately would go to an ISS anywhere up to a level five, uh, which could be a long-term suspension or expulsion. I'm just, you asked that question, so I'm sharing some of those things with, but I think the best advice I would give to parents is really dig into the Code of Student Conduct. It's on our website but it also comes out to parents through their alert now uh, from their school-based principal in the next, probably in the next few days. Okay, thank you. I, I know that seemed obvious, but I thought it needed to be said. Thank you. So that seems to take care of the queue. So uh, all in favor of this policy? Uh, um, Mrs. Weems? Yeah, I, I, I've had my hand up. I don't, you know, that's the consequence of being on Zoom. You always get called last. <laughs> So, um, yeah, I just want to, yeah, everybody.
actually yeah, asked my question You're breaking about up. Hold the on. capture, the health plan, the bus. Hey. Hello? You were breaking up, Mrs. Weems. Okay, I'm sorry. I'm, I'm way far away. Um, can you hear me now? Yeah, let's keep our fingers crossed. <laughs> okay, just um, just again, thank you, um, all the staff who brought this for, forward, because I really like the way it, it goes back to our strategic plan about academic excellence. And of course, you have to get student engagement for that. And of course, the well-being of the student. We've got, a, in my opinion, a crisis here of, of how much cell time, I mean, I mean, screen time is in front of our students and we've got to kind of change that whole culture. And so the parents, please, let's try to help um, these students and teachers buy a pocketbook, buy a fanny pack. They're coming back in, get a, get a book bag, a, a purse, you know, a, a phone carrier and encourage your students to do this to help our teachers. Teacher retention is, is a big, obviously, problem. And this was, you know, one of the number one reasons was, you know, of frustrations of our teachers and maybe some retiring earlier was discipline. And we all know that cell phone problems cause a lot of those discipline problems. So um, great news, I totally support it, but we need to really help the kids because this is gonna be a very hard change for our students. I'm um, knowing that they're on the cell phone, some of them, nine to 10, 11, 12 hours a day. So we've got to help this with, you know, as community members, as parents, teachers, administrators, everybody really have, we, we have to help these teenagers because it's a di different world that they've been in the last few years relying on, on the little thing in their hand. So, but thank you, thank you so much for bringing this forward. Okay, with that, all in favor, show a raised hand please for policy 3-65. Ms. Weems, how do you vote? Yes, of course. Ms. Franklin, how do you vote? Yes. Thank you, Madam Chair. We have unanimous vote. The motion did pass. Okay, so on a related note, we have the regulation. Which yeah, no, I will is an example because this is a discipline yeah. matter. This is why you Which vote is on why this the one. regulation is here. So I will, to introduce discussion, I will ask for a motion to approve. Mrs. Melnick and a second, Mrs. Anderson. Okay, Mr. Delaney, could you explain in your own way the, the, the regulation? Please. Sure. Uh, it, as it talks about in letter A there, that the personal cell phones, personal communication devices, and accessories, such as earbuds or personal wireless headphones, are prohibited during instructional time and in instructional settings. I would like to note, we've talked about several things here, but we use the term wireless headphones you look at the regulation, we are allowing wired headphones that can plug directly in to their Chromebook because we do have audio needs that are required on that end and we do use that in our supply list at times. So we're very intentional of a student that needs to use uh, one of our boost sites on our math program that can plug in and not be disturbed by others around them. So um, I failed to mention that earlier, but again, if parents are listening, personal wired headphones that they can utilize to go into those devices or, or are allowed. Um, we talked about the disciplining of students. We have some components around teachers and staff, their expectation to be consistent and fair within the disciplinary guidelines. And we also talk about the need for them to also be good stewards and modeling appropriate technology uh, behavior as well. So some of the earlier discussion did already address uh, much of this resolution. So any questions on the floor on the, on the regulation? I, I misspoke and said resolution when I meant to say regulation. All right, then, all in favor of regulation 3-65.1, show a raised hand, please. Ms. Weems, how do you vote? Yes. Thank you. Ms. Franklin, how do you vote? Yes. Thank you, Madam Chair. We have unanimous vote. The motion did pass. Thank you, and that concludes the action portion of the agenda. That leaves us with committee reports. Who would like to? Mrs. Felton. Thank you, Chair Ryan, for this opportunity. I just like to inform the board that on August uh, the 25th, I will be in Charlottesville on a uh, VSBA executive board meeting. If you have any suggestions or concern that you would like for me to carry up for you, please let me know um, by the end of the day tomorrow. 
Also, hopefully you've gotten a link to this meeting and you will be able to visit it uh, virtually and be a part of it as well. You can look in on it, but not be a participant, but you can actually see the meeting as well. If you did not get the link, please let me know. And I try to make sure that um, Michaela gets that to you as well. And just a little side note, I just like to say that I, I did go to the uh, care fair at Lane's Town High School. It was a wonderful event bombarded by people and most of all and the uh, students of our academy we had at least three academies there um, participating and one of the things that they said they wanted to do or make sure that we think about that we will allow the academy members to go out to the middle schools to recruit for the academy because they think it's a good thing and that the middle schools need those peers and the opportunity to see exactly how much fun that they're having uh, it was ran by the students, and they were all active, and I just enjoyed it, enjoyed it thoroughly with all the, uh, and transportation was there, getting application for school buses as well. So they were out there doing a thing, Ms. Winhouse. So thank you. Thank you. Anybody else? Okay, then, uh, with that, I'll be asking that I'm asking Vice Chair Melnick to read us into closed session. I move that the school board recess into closed session in accordance with the exemptions from open meetings law set forth in Code of Virginia 2.2-3711 to deliberate on the following matters. One. A closed meeting pursuant to the exemptions from open meetings allowed by section 2.2-3711 part A paragraph 1, 7, and 8 as amended. A. 1. For discussion, consideration, or interviews of prospective candidates for employment, assignment, appointment, promotion, performance, demotion, salaries, disciplining, or resignation of specific public officers, appointees or employees of any public body, and evaluation of performance of departments or schools of public institutions of higher education, where such evaluation will necessarily involve discussion of the performance of specific individuals, namely for the purpose of addressing the superintendent's annual goals, namely to discuss, one, request for payment of legal fees for an employee, two, contract, we have to write on it, contract amendments to the superintendent's employment contract, and three, audit committee recommendations regarding changes to the Office of an Internal Audit and the reposting of the job advertisement for the internal audit position. A, seven, consultation with legal counsel and briefings by staff members or consultants pertaining to actual or probable litigation where such consultation or briefing and open meeting would adversely affect the negotiating or litigating posture of the public body. For the purposes of this subdivision, probable litigation means litigation that has been specifically threatened or on which the public body or its legal counsel has a reasonable basis to believe will be commenced by or against a known party. Nothing in this subdivision shall be construed to permit the closure of a meeting merely because an attorney representing the public body is in attendance or is consulted on a matter. And A8, consultation with legal counsel employed or retained by a public body regarding specific legal matters requiring the provision of legal advice by such counsel. Nothing in this subdivision shall be construed to permit the closure of a meeting merely because an attorney representing the public body is in attendance or is consulted on a matter, namely to discuss status of pending litigation matters. So I made that motion. Wait a second. Mr. Sweets, the operator, show a raised hand, please. Madam Chair, we have 10 ayes. The motion did pass. So we'll cover the other things first. requirements by Virginia law were discussed in the closed meeting to which this certification applies and only such public business matters as were identified in the motion by which the closing closed meeting was convened were heard discussed or considered motion to approve mrs. Holtz a second mrs. Riggs all in favor show a raised hand please 
Madam Chair, we have 10 ayes. The motion did pass. Thank you. Now we can proceed with our vote. That's the contract? You gave me, you, we need the fees one. Okay. Oh, gosh. Okay, this is the resolution regarding payment of employee legal fees. Whereas that on November 10th, 2021, a VBCPS middle school teacher was charged with assault and battery of a minor student. And whereas that the charge against the teacher was dismissed by the Virginia Beach General District Court on April 4th, 2022, and the charge was later expunged from the teacher's criminal record by the circuit court May 18th, 2022. And whereas that the teacher and her attorney are seeking payment of legal fees in accordance with policy 2-59 in the amount of $1,514 in legal fees and costs incurred in defending this charge and having her criminal record expunged. And whereas that school board policy 2-59 allows the school board to pay an employee's legal fees incurred as a result of a lawsuit filed against the employee in their official capacity and provided that the lawsuit is later dismissed against the employee. Now therefore be it resolved that the school board authorizes payment of the employee's legal fees and costs in the amount of $1,514 and further resolve that the clerk is directed to send a copy of this resolution to the teacher, the teacher's attorney, school board attorney, the chief financial officer, the director of business services, and the chief human resources officer who is directed to place a copy of this resolution in the employee's personnel file. Adopted by the school board of the city of Virginia Beach this 23rd day of August, 2022. Motion to approve Mrs. Manning, a second. Mrs. Anderson, all in favor show a raised hand. Madam Chair, we have 10 ayes. The motion did pass. Thank you. And now, Mrs. Melnick, the second. Oh, okay. I move that the school board adopt amendment number 12 to the superintendent's contract and that the school board chair, school board attorney, and the school board clerk are authorized to take all necessary actions regarding the completion of the amendment. Motion to approve. Mrs. Anderson, a second. Mrs. Oh, wait, I moved. Oh, okay. Mrs. We'll say a motion to approve Mrs. Holtz and a second Mrs. Riggs. All in favor, show a raised hand, please. But I made the motion. Oh, that's what you meant. I thought. Yeah. Okay, so Miss Melnick made the motion. Who who is going to be the second? Mrs. Mrs. Holtz. <laughs> Beg your pardon, Mrs. Holtz. All right, let's start again. All in favor, please show a raised hand for the clerk. We have eight ayes. Okay. All opposed, please show a raised hand. Okay. We have two nays. The motion did pass eight to two. Thank you. And that concludes our, our formal meeting and our business for the evening.